The Human Resources Committee meeting uh, is called to order. Uh, first item on the list is public testimony. Uh, Barbara, do you want to speak now or you want to hold off until after? I, I put on the thing after. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Um, next item is approval of the minutes of April 21st, 2016. That is in your binder. I move for the approval of the minutes. Okay, motion is moved. Do I hear a second? Second. All those in favor, aye. All those opposed, motion carried. Item number four. I call for a motion to enter into an executive session pursuant to Hawaii Revised Status Section 92-4, subsections 92-5A4 and 92-5A2 to consider the annual evaluation of executive director, CEO, where considerations of matters affecting privacy will be involved and to consult with the committee's board's attorneys on questions and issuing pertaining to uh, issues pertaining to the committee's board powers, pr duties, privileges, immunities, and liabilities with regard to these matters. Can I get a motion, please? I still move. Okay, a second. Second. All those in favor, aye. Aye. All those opposed, we're in executive session. executive session um, before I continue I do have a testifier Barbara Amachow good morning Barbara Amachow for the record I'm a member of neighborhood board five but I am speaking as an individual um, I believe Dan has done as well as he could with everything that's happening, but uh, I'm still against giving a bonus. And I just want that to go on record again because of all the cost of the raise, raising of uh, all the costs on the rail. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Out of executive session, we are still continuing the evaluation process uh, and we'll still continue uh, moving forward. Can I call for adjournment? So moved. There a second? Second. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Okay, meeting's adjourned. Call to order the Board of Directors meeting of Thursday, May 12, 2016. First of all, calling for the public testimony on all agenda items, John Bond, would you like to speak now or later on? I'll like to speak now. You speak now. Come forward. Please state your name. Hello, good morning. My name is John Bond. I'm a, a president of Kanahili Cultural Hui. We're a rail programmatic agreement consulting party. Uh, today I'm here to talk about a uh, testimony on uh, the issue of tsunami flood zones. So I actually have a presentation I'll be passing on for your folks you can like, look at later, give one to Dan as well. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm starting off with the, the top frame of it is the Federal Emergency Management Administration top scientists warn major Pacific tsunami is overdue. Uh, the Japan tsunami was far larger and damaging than ever believed possible. Geophysicists at the University of Hawaii have identified a possible source region directly north of Hawaii that has the potential for a very large magnitude 9 plus earthquake that could produce a great pollution tsunami, GAT. Um, this is why they actually updated the 2015 City Department of Emergency, Man Emergency Management uh, flood zone uh, tsunami maps. Um, also, scientists predict the next big one, the California San Andreas Fault, locked, loaded, and ready to roll. That was a story just came out about a week ago in the news. Then um, also, scientists predict the Pacific Northwest Cascadia Fault, ready to go, creating massive tsunami waves. Um, it just so happens that next month, um, in June 7th through 10th, 
is going to be a major FEMA Pacific wide uh, earthquake tsunami exercise. So they are taking it very seriously. Um, so now we go to the specifics of the rail. Um, in June 2010, the Heart Rail final environmental impact statement was released stating the project was not in a tsunami evacuation zone. In January 18, 2011, the FDA issued a record of decision indicating that the project met all the requirements of environmental review and that the city is allowed to begin construction work on the project. The decision signed by FTA Region Administrator Leslie Rogers states that all reasonable steps are being taken to minimize the adverse environmental effects on the project and where adverse environmental effects remain, no feasible and prudent alternative to such exists. However, an alternative does exist. It's alternative 4A, the Salt Lake route, which was actually approved by the Honolulu City Council in 2007. Uh, that approved alternative would place most of the rail route above the city Department of Emergency Management tsunami evacuation zone. So th there's a map of it there, but we'll, we'll pass that out. Okay, so we move on. This is, this is fr uh, from the city's own DEM uh, fl tsunami zone maps that are on the website for the island of Oahu. Um, clearly seven heart rail stations are going to be in tsunami evacuation zones and this is the 2010 zones. The <coughs> 2015 zones have been greatly expanded so it includes everything. So all the downtown route through uh, from uh, Lagoon Drive, Middle Street on is all in a big giant tsunami evacuation zone. Mr. Bond, I'm going to have to ask you to summarize. I am. And Actually, I I'm just getting to my summarization. Okay, thank you. So, um, the Federal Transit Administration would very likely have not provided a favorable record of decision in 2011 if the tsunami evacuation zone was stated honestly in the June 2010 FEIS. So the big question becomes, was the June 10, uh, 2010 FEIS Appendix J statements that the project did not go through tsunami evacuation zones, was that an act of perjury to obtain federal funds? And um, I actually have talked to numerous federal officials in D.C. and around the country, and one of them at a very high level said, this does look like perjury to obtain federal funds. So perjury is a crime of willfully and knowingly making a false statement about a material fact. So in my cut to the chase to the end here, these are the uh, sections right out of the FES where they intentionally lied. And it says project is not located in tsunami zone. Project development subject to tsunami not applicable. And then another one, project is not located in the tsunami zone. It's right out of the FEIS. Thank you. So with that, uh, that's my testimony, and thank you very much. Members, any questions of Mr. Bond? Now, thank you, Mr. Bond. As you know, we do have this uh, uh, agendized uh, on uh, number 14 of today's agenda. Thank oh, you. Oh, tsunamis? Oh, the whole thing. Well, good. Then um, I'll give this one to Dan here for his record, and I'll give this to the lady here if she'd like to pass these around. I only have a few, but... You can give them any folks that like to see those. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Aloha. Thank you. Aloha. Anyone else? Uh, Barbara, do you want to testify now, Ms. Almatrot? Uh, or later? After presentation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else to testify on any or all agenda items? Ms. Iwasa. Thank you, Natalie Iwasa, for the record. Um, I'm not sure you got my testimony. I did submit it this morning, but. I wanted to um, put this under item 11, the formation of a permitted interaction group that will look at the policies and governance. Um, as you know, I've brought up a number of uh, instances where the um, financial information and, and numbers that have been provided to various entities and the public have had errors in them. And I brought this, um, this current um, example up last November, specifically detailing where there were problems with the cash flow statement. Now, I, I appreciate that they, they did um, include that these are actuals through March, but um, there are still some numbers in here that don't agree with things like the audited financial statements. 
And you know, with a project this big, this is that's just unacceptable. So I would ask that when you go through your um, meetings with the group, that you take a look at how, as the board, you know, with your responsibilities, how you can address this issue because. I've been bringing this up for a year and a half now, and it just, every time I look at something, I see something that's wrong, right on the face of it. So um, that's, that's mainly what I wanted to address. And also, um, you know, transparency, what, making things easier for people to see, for example, the beginning balance, just showing what, what this number is made up of, I think that goes a long way in providing better information for everybody. So. Um, Thank you for allowing me to testify this morning. Thank you, Ms. Iwasa. Any questions of Ms. Iwasa? No, thank you very much. Anyone else here to testify on all agenda items? If not, members, we will be moving on. So the next thing is um, board committee leadership and memberships. This is, these are basically our pigs. I love saying that. As you all know, pigs are the permitted interaction groups, which is uh, an exemption to the Sunshine Law. First, we have to dissolve certain of our pigs and reformat. Not now? No, we have to keep uh, items later on. Oh, so what is yeah. this? Committee. These are actually the, the standing committees. Oh, the standing committee. Yeah. Sorry. So this is the board's standing committees. Members, I'm going to just defer this until I find my paper. Here it is. Oh. Yeah. So I think the uh, members that we're looking at, <clears throat> the Government Affairs and Legal Matters Committees, I think that stays as it is. It is Terry Lee as chair. Uh, I am identified as vice chair. I think I'm going to switch that. <laughs> since I have the privilege of doing that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, how about Ivan Louis Kwan? Will you be vice chair of that? <laughs> I'd love to do that. Okay, so <laughs> Ivan Louis Kwan is now vice chair, since it's the chair's discretion. And the members will be Michael Formby and myself. Finance, uh, Ivan Louis Kwan remains as chair. Terry Fujii is vice chair and the George Atta, Michael Formby, Ford Fujigami, and Terrence Lee will remain in that same order. Uh, project oversight. Michael Formby will be chair. Damian Kim will be vice chair. Um, Ivan Louis Kwan will be a member, as will uh, Buzzy Hong will also be a member and I will remain as a member of that project oversight committee. Then transit-oriented development, that remains with, with uh, Mr. Hong Buzzy as chair, Ivan Louis Kwan as vice chair, George Atta, Michael Formby, and Ivan Louis Kwan as members. The human resources, is Damien Kim as chair, Michael Formby as vice chair, and myself, Buzzy Hong, Terry Lee, and Ivan Louis Kwan will be members. Would you like a motion for that chair, Madam yes. Chair? Yes, no, I don't think I need a motion. I think yeah, that's my, under the rules, it's, I, it's my discretion, so. Oh. Later on, you know. Yeah. So we will also be amending this as soon as we hear from uh, uh, Mr. Matsumoto as to what committees he would like to sit on. Yeah. Okay. I, I think that um, definitely I will ask uh, Mr. Matsumoto to consider sitting on finance as well as uh, project oversight, but we will wait for his confirmation that he wants to do it. Thank you. Yes. 
I think Ford, Ford might be one of you on some of the committees. Ford Fujigami? Yeah, he is a, a member, isn't he? We asked them to respond, so we'll wait to hear from Ford Fujigami as well. I think he's on finance. He's on finance. Yeah. <coughs> right. He's also on finance. And we're putting Ford on some of the pigs, so thank you. Members, now I'm calling for the uh, approval of the April 21st, 2016 minutes of the meeting of the board. Is there any comments by the members of the committee on that? Any members of the public, first of all, because this is a voting item, anyone wishes to testify on the minutes? No? Members? Move to accept. Motion made by Vice Chair Kim. Second. Second by Mr. Hong. Any further discussion, members? If not, uh, can I just call for unanimous consent? Yeah. Yes. yes. Thank you very much. It's been approved. Now we have to comply with Sunshine, and these are the board members' report of attendance. First is going to be the council, City Council Budget Committee meeting of April 27, 2016. I believe it had um, Mr. Kwan and Michael Formby. So if either of you and both of you would make a report to the board. Uh, Chair, I was present, but not in my capacity as a board member, but instead as the director of DTS. Okay, Mr. Kwan, would you like to make a <laughs> statement then? Um, it was a meeting of the budget committee and they took up a discussion on the, the audit by, this, by the city auditor and was, uh, I think, a very productive discussion. Any other corrections or anything by Mr. Formby since you were there? No, I agree. Thank you. you agree? So members, that is our report on that. Uh, the next thing is the train unveil unveiling event on May 2nd, 2016. Uh, myself, uh, <coughs> Terry Fujii, Damian Kim, and Ivan Louis Kwan attended that train unveiling. Uh, members, I would just say that um, it was, I think someone put it very aptly when they said it's very nice to have something positive associated with the, with the whole rail system. Uh, it seemed like people were very excited about the seeing it actually there on the track moving, albeit for a relatively short distance. Uh, it was uh, the nice touch, I think, was the fact that they did put in a surfboard. It was also very interesting. Uh, my classmate, I will make the full disclosure, from high school is uh, the head of the handy van, and that is Charlotte Townsend. And Charlotte was, um, as you know, she, she is in a wheelchair, and she told me that it wasn't difficult to get in with her wheelchair, which I think is a concern that we all have. So I would say, oh, and it has room for bicycles and surfboards. But it was a, 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 an event that I thought um, brought the community out and made the whole issue very real to them. So anyone else would like to add to that who was present? No? I, I was present. I thought it was, a, as, as you say, <coughs> Madam Chair, a very uplifting event, and we need uplif uplifting events for this project as often as, often as we can get it. Um, the second thing is that um, I noticed also not only surfboards and bicycles, but also there's a rack for luggage. Um, in fact, it had a bag of luggage on it. Um, and the reason I was aware of that is because um, one of my partners had said they had read someplace that luggage was not going to be allowed and so I asked the person from Ansaldo who had done the design if there was luggage said yes there is. Um, the third thing I wanted to say is that I was I was very impressed with the um, the comments made um, by by you and by our CEO. Um, the thing that impressed me about your comments were um, I hadn't realized you had been living with this with this project for such a long part of your life. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> when you indicated that you were working on this when you were president of the state senate. So I thought that was um, very enlightening and, and helpful for, for my understanding. Any other comments? I, I think the reference to luggage may raise something for Mr. Formby <laughs> because I think the issue is going to be transition from <coughs> rail to bus. 
because I think bus still has the limitations on luggage, doesn't it, Mr. Yeah, Pony? we do have limitations in the existing ordinance, and we are looking at those. Um, we're also talking with private companies about baggage luggage service that will be offered at the airport direct to hotels if people choose to ride transit, so there will be alternatives to bringing larger luggage on the train and then on the bus. Thank you, but that, 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 that was what caught my eye, is because I remember a bus has these very interesting rules about whether it has to sit on your lap. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for the public, we understand that that transition issue, and hopefully we'll have it all worked out before they have to uh, be faced with it. Thank you, anyone else? Not, oh, Barbara, Ms. Armitra. Barbara Armentrout, for the record, I'm a member of Neighborhood Board 5. I did talk to Mr. Grabowskis uh, when you were an executive in the previous finance, or the human resources, uh, regarding the train unveiling. I, I saw pictures of it and I was concerned and I've had people come up and talk with me because sometimes it seems to be more of a uh, uh, European design inside and I've been in Paris and London on the the rails and a lot of them are not ADA compliant what I noticed was missing was anything very low for people on walkers uh, canes being able to hold on to something not just the poles that go down because a lot of the people and we have a lot of Orientals here that are very short are not going to be able to reach the bars that are going up. So I'm concerned that maybe uh, different uh, dis uh, people, maybe from sea fodder with different disabilities, could go in and see if they'd be able to walk from spot to spot or if they're stuck in the middle without holding on to anything because a lot of them need to hold on. When you go on a bus and you watch someone that's trying to go sit in another seat, they're holding on as they go at their level, not above, because a lot of them can't even reach up top. So I'm only concerned about some of the dis disabled and their, their needs as going on there, because they can't go on and then grab onto a bike to hold on to as they're going past the bike. So that's my concern on that. And I noticed when I was in uh, uh, France and England, a lot of times they're not ADA compliant on it. I mean, the United States is lucky we have ADA. Thank, Thank you. you. And I'm sure Mr. Grabowskis will uh, yeah, look into I that. Did. I invited him to the Sea Fodder meeting Tuesday if he's available. Thank you. I, I do want to share with you a funny story because uh, Senator Hirono and I joke about being height challenged because we are the exactly that population that you're talking about. There are these little straps. I don't know if you saw them. And we joked about the fact that they were sensitive to our height challenge because we could actually reach into those stra straps. <laughs> Not the bar, but the strap. So we were also concerned about that. So so that you know, there are these little blue straps mm -hmm. and um, we could reach it. So we thought we can reach it, a lot of people can. Right. Well, we like I struggling. said, I haven't seen it, but I, ca I have degenerative, I cannot do it because of cervical. There's a lot of people who can't raise their hands over their head. But so I, they wouldn't I be able my, to. My, my reaching, it would probably be the same as, and you wouldn't have to reach as high. No, I can't even go that high because I've got bulgy nerves and stuff going down my arms. I can't. So. And like I said, I'm sure Mr. Grabowskis will look into yeah. that. Thank you yeah, for bringing I talked to, to him attention. about it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to testify about our train that's not taking us height challenge people into consideration? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, next next matter is the Council Budget Committee of May 10th, 2016. Ivan Louis Kwan and Damien Kim are identified of having attended. Either one of you would like to give us a report to comply with Sunshine? What, what date is that? May 10th, 2016. No, I was not there you were that. not there? I was not there. On that. You were not yeah. there? May 10th. I've been to so many of these meetings that <laughs> <laughs> two, two days ago. Two days ago. Yeah. Um, 
Okay. Yes, I thought there, there was a, a, a meeting of the budget committee. Right. I thought there was an excellent um, um, meeting in terms of um, presentation by staff, and probably more importantly, the um, the discussion items that were raised by the city council members that I thought were very well uh, responded to by staff. Um, what. There, there was a lot of discussion about the interaction with the, the FTA, and that was very significant. I thought another significant item of discussion had to do with the, um, the interaction between Hart and HECO, and I thought our, our um, deputy director, Mr. Morioka, did a, did a very good job in, in explaining the status quo and where we are and, and um, um, the, the potential uh, remedies um, for particularly on the the west side and that the remedy for the east side is is really the, the decision that had been made by staff to underground the utilities particularly on on uh, on Dillingham so I thought I, I really thought it was a very good opportunity for staff to explain uh, concerns and not just I'm sure the city council members said but also maybe the public thank you since no one else was anyone else there no? Thank you. So the next uh, item uh, is the FTA quarterly meeting, which was held yesterday, uh, May 11, 2016, and Michael Formby and I attended it. We call this the PMOC meeting. You've heard us talk about it. Mike, would you like to uh, do a report on that? Sure. So um, you, um, I think I started at 8.30 and left around 12, and you joined around 9 o'clock, and we were able to listen to FTA Leslie Rogers and his staff along with the PMOC um, receive a briefing from the Hart staff and it was very informative and uh, took home some materials to review and I'm still reviewing those materials but uh, I think it was it was very informative from the level of understanding uh, the discussions that Hart is having with the FTA about project budget and project schedule. Thank you. Uh, I, I concur with that, and uh, as uh, I have said in the past, it is a, um, a meeting that if uh, other members of the board uh, uh, can avail themselves of, I highly recommend it. We just got an opinion from uh, Corporation Council, which I did not know, is that at least five members can attend at a time, so we don't have to watch the two-two as we have in the past. But they, um, and it's sort of in line. I did not attend the council budget committee meeting, but I did watch it on television, and they were also they, meaning the council members, were also very interested in the possibility of interacting with the FTA because they feel that that's the missing element for a lot of their questions. So. Thank you very much. Any other comments? Uh, now, we are going to go into, <laughs> this is what we call Rail Project 101. Uh, members, this is for primarily our benefit and members of the public who may not have been following the rail issue. And what uh, we're calling on Mr. Morioka to to do this presentation. And what we're hoping for is this is gonna concentrate on the West. So this is gonna be the beginning of a series that depending on how this is received by everyone, that we would like to have available and presented so that the public can see how this project has actually progressed. I think unless you're on the West side driving it every day, uh, you may not realize what has happened out there. So. Morioka. Thank you, Chair Hanabusa. Uh, members, Brennan Morioka, uh, Deputy Executive Director for HART. Um, appreciate this opportunity to kind of give the board, especially some of our newer members who um, have been added over the last year uh, and, and who may not have necessarily been had the opportunity to take a tour of the entire rail alignment uh, and see some of the progress over time. But this presentation is, is number one, to give the board and the public a general update on uh, the construction activities on the west, but also to start 
the dialogue and getting some of the visual aspects into people's minds as we start to talk about the east and so what is going to happen on the east is already happening or has already happened on the west so so talking about the history of the west side is is really important in order to set the table for our next discussion which will be the eastern the eastern ten miles so i appreciate this opportunity to to brief the board so we always start off again with the general description of what the rail project is and it is a 20 mile elevated guideway system with 21 stations uh, extending from east kapole on the west side at the croc center into ho'opili waipahu pearl city pearl ridge Ia'ea, and it continues on into town by the airport kalihi uh, Kaka'ako and then ends at the Al Alamana Shopping Center. Just, just some uh, very brief history, high level history on the actual construction work that is going on on the west side. Uh, the West Oahu Farrington Highway Guideway contract was awarded to Kiwit Construction in November of 2009. The Kamehameha Highway Guideway contract was awarded to Kiwit in June of 2011 and then the maintenance and storage facility, which we now call the Rail Operation Center. That contract was awarded to Kiwit Kobayashi Joint Venture in June of 2011 as well. Uh, because this is a design build, some of the work activity did begin uh, at those times. However, construction was placed on hold in August of 2012 uh, due to the Kalikini versus Yoshioka uh, lawsuit. And then uh, after resolution of that lawsuit, construction resumed in September of 2013. So just to give you a very, uh, or a easier visual of the alignment itself, I'm just gonna run through about a four minute video of the alignment from end to end with station locations. The proposed 20 mile elevated big guideway begins at the East Kapolei station with a park and ride. This is adjacent to the planned Department of Hawaiian Homelands residential development. It follows North South Road to the next stop, the UH West Oahu Station with the park and ride. The route continues through Ho'opili to the Ho'opili Station. The route continues on to Farrington Highway, past Hawaii Medical Center West, travels over Fort Weaver Road to Waipahu's West Block Transit Station at the Leoku Street intersection. <laughs> it continues down the median of Farrington Highway at approximately 30 feet above street level to the Waipahu Transit Center Station near the Wokola Street intersection. Passing Waipahu High School and the preferred site for the maintenance and storage facility. The next stop along Farrington Highway is the Leeward Community College Station. The route then crosses over H1 to the Pearl Highland Station with a park and ride. Commuters from Central Oahu will have a dedicated access route from H2 to the transit station. The guideway then continues within the median of Kamehameha Highway, crossing Waimalo Home Road past Pearl City Shopping Center. Over H1, Why the stream to the Pearl Ridge Station. Continuing along the median of Kamehameha Highway through Aea, the route continues in the median of Kamehameha Highway, serving the Aloha Stadium Station with a parking ride. Continuing on Kamehameha Highway, to the Pearl Harbor Naval Base Station at Makalapa Gate. Around the Pearl Harbor Interchange, 
follows H1. To the Honolulu International Airport Station. Continues on Aulele Street. To the Lagoon Drive Station. Follows the edge of Ke'ehi Lagoon Park over Linnitz Highway to the Mill Street Transit Center Station. Past Kuuhali Road into the Kalihi Station. It travels along the middle of Dillingham Boulevard over Kapal Lama Stream to the Kapal Lama Station at Honolulu Community College. It follows Dillingham Boulevard to the Ivile Station, turns onto the median of Limits Highway past the Chinatown Station at Kekalike Street, then into the Downtown Station near Aloha Tower. On to Halekomina Street, to the Civic Center Station on South Street. Then, onto the Kaka'ako Station at Ward Avenue. It continues Malka, onto Koma Street, to the final stop at the Alamoana Center Station Terminus. So hopefully that video kind of gives you a very good idea of the general communities that the rail alignment goes through and then where the stations uh, intersect and uh, will be embedded within those communities. Um, so one of the, the main things that we always also talk about is now that the discussion is not necessarily about whether we are building rail or not, it's how will rail look and how will rail operate. So one of the, so some of the system and rail vehicle features that are uh, commonly uh, asked about is the operational times uh, and, and how often trains come to the station. And so uh, we will run our trains between 4 a.m. and midnight uh, as a starting point for our operational hours. Trains will run between five minutes uh, to every station during peak hours, both in the morning and afternoons, and then about 10 to 11 minutes during non-peak hours. And then the average, uh, the, the uh, maximum speed of a train in between stations is about 55 miles an hour and then on average from end to end including the amount of time uh, that a train is stopped at a station to let people on and off the average speed is about 30 miles an hour which again is much faster than any car going on H1 during morning rush hour or in the afternoon um, we are fully integrated with the bus uh, we have cultural motifs and artwork that are uh, integrated into our stations as a part of um, our aesthetics. Um, our four car train sets accommodate 190 seats. Uh, we have eight wheelchair areas. We have flip seats to uh, provide additional wheelchair areas. As, as discussed earlier, we accept or allow luggage, motorized wheelchairs, strollers, surfboards, and bikes. Um, and then we will have both audible and visual messages inside the vehicle as well as at our stations. And then we have emergency phones in, vehicle, uh, in the vehicles and at our stations as well as accessible gangways to all four cars which is not a common feature in most uh, current rail transit systems. Some of the safety features, um, we've talked a lot about the platform screen gates. Um, this is a direction that uh, Hart decided to go to in, in light of the fact that we are introducing a rail transit system that many people here in Hawaii are not used to riding rail transit and so this is an additional safety feature that uh, I think everyone believed was necessary for our, our, um, our passengers. 
some of the general design concepts just so that uh, everyone is up to speed because there have been a lot of discussion uh, previously while we were doing a lot of the, the construction work in Farrington Highway and on Kamehameha Highway as to uh, what some of the final designs or what, what, is, what is the road we're going to look like at the end of the day. Uh, and so this is just a typical cross section of what Farrington Highway looks like. Uh, this is an, a cross section closer to one of the intersections, so you have merge lanes and a left turn pocket and right turn pocket. But the general concept of this is that there is the guideway that goes down the middle with a median with curbing. Uh, then you also have Farrington Highway is currently two lanes in each direction, so it's a four lane highway. Uh, those four lanes will be preserved in, at the end of the day. And then we have sidewalks on both sides. So this is a, a very good dis uh, example of what Farrington Highway will look like at the end of the day. Actually, this is kind of what it looks like right now as Kiwit starts to wrap up some of their final, uh, uh, final civil work. And then this is kind of a, a plan view of what intersections will typically look like, where we are preserving left turn uh, storage capacities in order to allow safe turning movements, uh, especially in light of the fact that you can see the median in the middle of the road where some uh, locations that people have uh, historically been used to making left turns, free left turns across the road into open driveways. Uh, many of those turning movements will be uh, prohibited once the final construction is done. Uh, and that is primarily a safety issue because you, now you have these big columns in the way, sight distance is an issue. Uh, where we are able to preserve some of those left turn movements, uh, we, we are looking at them and we'll have that in the final um, construction work. And we're also doing that right now on Kamehameha Highway uh, as we go through uh, a final evaluation of all the left turn movements that are currently out there. Uh, but general description of where, especially where uh, you can make U-turns. So we have had to make accommodations because now you have many people that have to pass a location where they used to be able to make a left turn, now having to make a left turn at an, a new intersection. Uh, so we have to make sure that we accommodate that additional uh, vehicle capacity at these intersections. So a lot of engineering going around in, in terms of changed driver behavior and patterns. Some of the stations, just a very general um, schematic of what a, the general components of a, what a station looks like. You have the station entry and the fare gate modules where you have the, the, the fare gates that you have to go through. This is also where you'll buy tickets if you don't already have one of the, the fare passes. Uh, walkways with, you get up to the uh, upper levels either through stairs, escalators, or elevators. You, we have concourses at many of our stations to get to either side platform, platform canopies uh, to stand in the shade while you wait for the train, and then you have the guideway that goes down the center. So I'm going to go over the uh, nine stations and give you some visual renderings of what these stations are anticipated to look like in the general area that they are being constructed. First one is the East Kapolei Station uh, right near the Croc, Croc Center. This is either the first or the 21st station, whichever direction you want to look at it. Kualaka'i Parkway or what used to be called the North-South Road uh, in the foreground. UH West Oahu was on the bottom. This is the University of Hawaii West Oahu Station. Uh, you have UH West Oahu on the west side or on the left. Ho'opili Development on the right or on the eastern side. Again, we're going down the Diamond Head side of Kualaka'i Parkway. The Ho'opili Station, uh, once Ho'opili is built out by DR Horton, we do go down their greenway, uh, uh, which is along their street. West Lock Station, this is an aerial view just to kind of see where it is. You got First Hawaiian Bank, Don Quixote uh, across the way. This is looking Mauka to Makai. So this is actually in the parking lot area of the Don Quixote Shopping Center by First Hawaiian Bank. Next one is the Waipahu Station uh, where, where there is also the Waipahu Transit Center. And again, this is looking from Mauka to Makai. This is from the, the tran bus <coughs> transit center side that we're looking at because this station is primarily meant to filter to, towards the, the bus transit center. 
Leeward Community College, we are right at the edge of their parking area where we, we uh, removed some of their uh, portables for their OSUD program and moved it to a different location as well as their motorcycle program. This is what it's gonna look like in that corner. This is our only at grade station within our system. Uh, you do en enter it from the bottom and then you go underneath via a tunnel and then come up uh, in the middle. Cross H1 to Pearl Highlands or the Banana Patch area right near Sam's Club and Pearl Highlands Shopping Center. And I really like this rendering because this shows the entire Pearl Highlands complex which is the ramp. You see the ramp going to the left uh, which connects H2 directly into the parking structure and the bus transit center. Then you have the 1600 stall parking garage, the guideway that goes right next to it, and then the bus transit center right in between uh, the parking garage and the, uh, the actual rail transit station itself. Pearl Ridge Station, right by Homeworld and across the kitty corner from Anna Miller's. And again, looking from Mauka to Makai. This is also the location that DTS um, is developing a potential bus transit center at this location, as well as uh, working with DPP on uh, possible TOD opportunities at this location as well on the Makai side. Then we, could, then we end with Aloha Stadium Station in the Kamehameha lot, which is across the street from the, the main Aloha Stadium proper. That this parking, ri parking ride will accommodate approximately 600 stalls. Uh, we have a working agreement with the Aloha Stadium that on game days, uh, we do turn it over from the night before back to the stadium so that they can utilize it for paid parking. Uh, for their patrons to attend games or graduations or whatever it is and then after their event they turn it back over to us uh, and so for the most part the majority of the year this will be a park and ride facility that will be maintained and operated by uh, heart and then this is looking from the parking lot side looking Mackay towards Richardson Field uh, at this at the uh, stadium station and then every, in all of our stations, we have uh, our aesthetic column program. The stations are, um, are founded upon eight, six to eight columns, uh, each of which have this unique aesthetic column wrapping uh, that is meant to tell the story of each of the different ahupua'as uh, that that station is in. It's a very historical and cultural educational program that we have. And then we have our station art program. Again, this, the art program in our station is meant to be uh, lower maintenance and something that is actually built into the uh, station itself. So it's not meant to be uh, mobile or, or um, displays that can be taken down very easily because they need to be maintained and, and uh, kept there in perpetuity as a part of the station. So everything has to be durable, low maintenance type uh, art design. And then now to get to some of the visual aspects of the construction activities. And I'm going to go through the different phases of the types of activities uh, from utility relocation all the way to the guideway placement. So one of the biggest things and biggest risks of this project, not just uh, for the first 10 miles, but ongoing into the eastern 10 miles is always utility relocations. Not just for this project, but for any kind of roadway project that you have to open up the ground where you have to deal with utilities. It's always a risk because there are many undocumented utilities in the roads. But just to kind of give you a flavor for the amount of volume of, of linear footage that we had to deal with on the, on the uh, West Oahu Farrington Highway Station Group, I mean uh, Highway Guideway contract, you see 21,000 linear feet of electrical and telecommunication lines. So that's HECO, uh, Oceanic, Hawaiian Telecom, Sandwich Isle communications, all those types of communication fiber optics that we had to uh, either relocate or protect. Same with uh, Board of Water Supply, cities, drainage and sewer lines, and then uh, Hawaii Gas. And then not as much, but uh, quite, a, quite a significant amount of linear footage for uh, Kamehameha Highway Guideway as well. 
We do try and do a lot of the work at night as much as possible, but again, um, because of noise restrictions, especially when we get closer to residential areas, um, there are some limitations, but uh, because utility relocation work is probably the most disruptive in terms of traffic, just because you're digging up a lot of the road, opening up a lot of tre wide trenches, uh, you take up a lot of lane. So we try to find that balance in, in trying to do as much work at night, um, but th at the same time, that's the kind of act work activity that requires probably the loudest type of, war, uh, of uh, equipment uh, in order to open up the trenches. So we've got to find that balance, and, and we are working on that for the east side as well. Trenching along, along the guideway. Actually, these kinds of, of utility lines that go along the road is typically easier for us to deal with because uh, it, it requires the least amount of workspace or least amount of lane closures. When we have lines, and it can be very, very small lines that go across a road, those typically become much more problematic because not, just because it, even though it's, it's in a much more smaller area, the, the fact that it crosses multiple lanes makes it from a public perspective uh, much more disruptive. And so that kind of management of, of those work activities become, uh, the coordination becomes even more critical. And then we have also very large pipes as well. This, is, this looks like about a 36 inch line. Then the next phase would come in, the contractor would come in and do drilled shafts. Uh, this is down Farrington Highway. Um, they take up quite a bit of space in the middle of the road. As you can see, the equipment, I mean, and, and, and they do, we do try and work with the contractor to only limit them to what they need. And as you can see from this, their equipment for the drill rig is really crammed in there, so their workspace is extremely limited. Uh, so we also start to balance the, the, uh, the benefit of the public a, a, by maintaining as many lanes as possible, but, also, but that then has an impact on contractor efficiency. And so you know, there's that balance as well, because we want a contractor to be more efficient because we want them to get in and get out because that also helps the public's um, transportation as well. So there is that balance that we have to do a lot of coordination. This is the size of the shaft. That's a casing that they uh, do the drilling work in. Uh, you can see the, the pump truck is pumping grout into, or concrete into the uh, foundation. And then the next phase would come, they would come and put these, or these red or orange uh, column forms on top. Uh, and then they just continue to work their way down. As you can see in, in this one, there's also a, a pump, concrete pump truck pumping concrete into this one of the column, uh, column forms. And then this is just another one that shows them dropping the steel uh, reinforced ca uh, caging into the column before they are going to pour the concrete. And again, a lot of heavy equipment right down the center of the road, which is also why they need to take up a lot of space on our roadways. And then more column work, pumping concrete into the columns. Then they finally come on with their um, traveling trusses to place the precast box girders on top. Uh, this is just an aerial to show the kind of workspace that they need. Whenever they are actually placing um, segments on top of the truss, they need to have that area below free and clear, which is why um, we do try and work out in far in advance those opportunities for them to do the crossings over an intersection because when they're placing the, the precast segments on top of the truss while they're over the intersection, we do need to close the intersection down completely. Street view of what the truss looks like if you haven't driven by some of the construction work. Another view from on top. I think this is from one of Kiwit's drones that they took a photo of. This is down Kamehameha Highway in Pearl City area. And then another, this is right across the street, or right by uh, Sam's Club. Uh, they're right about to cross over the intersection. And then this is a photo of the balanced cantilever at H1 by the Sears Distribution Center. So this is their approach coming over as they're gonna start uh, the balanced cantilever work uh, probably in the next few months. And then just to kind of give you a general sense of duration, how long is it going to take? And 
This is, this is a little misleading in terms of the overall construction time, but what this is is if you were to be standing at a specific location on Kamehameha Highway or, or maybe now on Dillington, Dillingham Boulevard, if I stand at this place um, and I just don't move, how long can I expect some of these specific activities to occur right in front of me or right in front of my business? And so a general breakdown would be when the utility relocation work comes in, uh, really depending on what they find, it can take anywhere from six to nine months of work right in front of that specific location. Then they're gonna go away because they're gonna be doing a lot of other work elsewhere. But the sequence will be to come in and their next sequence of work or phase of work would be the shaft foundation. They'll bring in their drill rigs, set up their uh, K rail to protect their work area. And the shaft work itself right in front of that business would take approximately one to two months. That time, again, again, really depends. If it's really good material, they can wrap this thing out pretty quick. But if it's some very, very difficult material or deep shafts, it's gonna take a little bit longer. So one to two months is a, a general duration. Then they're gonna go away because they're gonna start moving down, um, down the road. And then the, the next set of uh, construction crews will come in and start doing the construction column, uh, act, the column construction activities. And that too takes about one to two months right in front of that, that one business. Then they'll go away, and then the next crew will come in with the truss and start insta installation of the guideway segments. And that, too, takes approximately one to two months. Uh, Kiwit has uh, been able to do certain stretches in a matter of four weeks, uh, especially on the straightaways, but that is not always common. Um, it's, it is when they start ramping up and they have a good um, uh, mo set of momentum going their way. Uh, but just on the safe side, we do typically try to budget approximately one to two months in a specific location for Kiwi to get in and get across. And then one of the other major aspects that needs to be a part of our program, uh, we've been doing this on the west side. I think there is a lot of lessons learned from the west side uh, activities. Uh, I think that we've learned that we could have done a lot of things differently, a lot of things better. I think we uh, have taken a lot of that in and are now applying it to what we're doing, especially on the east side, where we've already started to do a lot of this stuff in anticipation of the construction work, even though construction really is another year or two out. Um, but we are trying to uh, get in front of as many business groups as possible. We've spoken to uh, Honolulu Community College in their town hall. We've held a public meeting for the, the general public along Dillingham. Uh, at Kalihikai Elementary uh, last week and then just yesterday we were speaking to the Kalihi Business Association and we have a whole bunch of, of business meetings lined up and, and we have been doing a lot of outreach in, in, as well as in sm very much smaller groups as well. Um, but we do work with businesses uh, on special signage to make sure that the public knows that these businesses are still open. You can drive by and see a whole bunch of cones in front of an area and, and just assume that the business is closed. But we want to make sure that people when they're driving by know that if I was trying to get to a certain business uh, that they are in fact still open and this is how I'm going to get to it. So we work with them on access uh, to and from their business and we want to ensure that, that access is maintained at all times during their business hours. Uh, and we do provide them as much timely construction information in as far in advance as we can. Obviously during construction, we all know that construction timelines change on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and so when those things do change after we've already told them something, we do try and make sure that they get the most updated uh, information as, as it is available. Um, and then we do work with businesses in trying to understand what kind of activities do they do? What is their, their delivery schedule? What kind of trucks do they use to deliver? Right? Because smaller delivery trucks or vans is very different than from 40 foot containers. So we need to understand that when we work with our contractors on the type of MOT and access that we have to provide to these businesses, as well as having monthly business meetings um, that I think uh, many people have found beneficial. And many of the businesses on the east side have already asked us when will those biz monthly business meetings start because they're very anxious to, to get in front of this as well. Uh, we do have heart uh, business alliances with a number of, of different partners, uh, Hawaii Small Business Development Center or SBDC, Small Business Administration, Chamber of Commerce, the Patsy Ming Center for Business and Leadership. Um, but we do work with all of these different groups to try and put them in front of these businesses if they need any form of assistance that, that these groups might be able to provide to them. Uh, we work with them on 
social media, training them on social media to prepare for the new demographic that is going to be uh, become their customer base. And uh, so there's a whole bunch of different things that we do work with the businesses on. And then one of the, the other things that we do do is the shop and dine on the line, which we've already started to uh, get a number of businesses on the, the eastern side, especially Dillingham, to start signing up. Uh, we have well over 100 businesses that are participating. Most of them obviously are on the west side in, in Waipahu and Pearl City. Uh, but we are starting that outreach uh, to these groups on the, on the east side. I mean, one of the, one of the things that, that I, I, the story I like to, that I like to tell because I was told it and I didn't realize that it happened, um, you know, many people often look at this as a discount program, uh, and, and that's not really what this is. Shop and Dine on the Line is really our effort to try and promote businesses who are a part of this corridor, who are struggling and who need everyone's help as a community. We can help uh, our, our, our community businesses, even if you don't live in that specific area. You know, one of the, one of the success stories is that there is this um, tailor or seamstress who is in the Pearl Ridge area who just kind of operated on word of mouth. You know, if someone used them, they liked her, they would kind of refer other people to her, and that's how she kind of got by on her business. Um, but she signed up for Shop and Dine on the line, and once people started kind of looking through it, People actually started to go to her, and so her business is is flourishing much more so than it than it was before. Even during this period of of, of uh, construction impacts and traffic uh, congestion all in the area, so these are some of the the very positive stories that that this uh, program I think has has developed over time, and I think we I think we can have more and more of those as we move into the the eastern side. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions, and and I hope that it was informative as well as gives people a, a visual perspective of what kind of work is has been done and is going to be done as we start talking about the eastern side. Thank you. Members, any questions or comments? Terry? Yeah, Brendan, where is the last, the Alamana train station, I'm, I'm not, not sorry, where is the l rail line ending in Alamana? Because at one time I thought it was ending by the Bank of Hawaii. At Alamana yeah. Shopping Center? Right. So the, right now the Alamana station is um, just Eva of Konaiki Street. So we did move it 200 feet to the west. To the west, okay. Yeah. But the tail track, to your point, um, uh, Member Lee, is the tail track did actually go almost all the way to the end before uh, where, where the Ala Moana Medical Building is. Got it, okay. Because we still have to have a tail track. So even though right. the station has been moved, the tail track still extends a good 200 feet or so beyond it, 300 feet beyond that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Atta? Uh, yeah, uh, Brennan, I was at, uh, I just attended the um, American Planning Association Phoenix meeting, and I uh, attended some of the real uh, TOD sessions, and somebody suggested that uh, the Minneapolis, when they did their Green Line extension, they worked with the arts community of the, of the city, and they programmed uh, art activities and other cultural activities in the, in the construction zone to actually to tell people to come to the construction rather than say, this is construction zone, stay away. It, it actually you know, programmed things to, to draw people to it. In a, and in, in a way, it ended as a kind of celebration of the construction of the rail. And, the, and they said that it uh, was very successful in, in the Green Line extension and that when the line was finished, all these activities along the line uh, became a kind of identity for for these bus these areas, and when the uh, the rail actually opened, uh, all of these activities continued uh, seamlessly, and it made people uh, look to the to the rail line as a place to go, not mm -hmm. to stay stay away. So, I would suggest that maybe somebody from the staff go talk to the uh, uh, Minneapolis rail thing and consider working with Honolulu's arts and culture community to program things within the corridor. To, uh, okay. I, oh, I heard it was very successful. And we, and we do look for some of those community opportunities. Um, and and, and it, it's, it's not just heart too, right? I know there's other uh, entities uh, that look for those kinds of opportunities around uh, the rail project. City Square just worked with um, the Hawaii Chamber of Commerce 
uh, I'm Chamber of Commerce of Hawaii on doing a, a ev fairly large event at, at their property uh, to kind of rally around um, their, their community to get ready for rail, basically what it was. So uh, I, I thought it was a great event and, and something that you're suggesting I think is, is a very positive thing that we could do. Because yeah, I mean, I think construction activity, I mean, I don't know if I'm, I'm you know, I think a lot of people would find the activity itself kind of interesting just to watch. Right. So if you give them opportunities and events and reasons to hang around and watch, I think it might be positive. Thank you. Good question. <clears throat> Mr. Lee Kwan. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. At the, um, the, the City Council Budget Committee meeting um, on Tuesday, the, the 10th, and also in um, meetings, briefing meetings that we've had with City Council members, particularly Council Member Ozawa, I was really focused on that um, Ala Moana station. And he was principally concerned about um, so many developers wanting to do plans um, in that proximate area mm -hmm. and uh, was very concerned about where would the route be to um, UH Manoa um, and what impacts it would have depending on where it was um, um, going to be um, sited whether it goes along Kapilani Boulevard, where it goes along Ala Moana Boulevard, where it goes straight through, through, through Kona Street. Uh, can you talk about those, those um, you know, the, the, the first, where you have it sited now, um, what opportunities are there for doing the extension and what, what properties will be impacted? Okay, that's a bunch of loaded questions. <laughs> Um, some, some of which I can't necessarily answer um, because what we are authorized to build is the alignment as it's currently approved down Kona Street with a station in the general vicinity of where we're putting it. Um, we do have the ability to move it just a little bit um, to make sure that its final design, its final flow uh, is the best and maximized uh, use, which is why we did move it about 200, 200 feet uh, from where it was uh, originally planned to be uh, to its new location where we have it in our procurement documents. Um, in terms of the extension to UH Manoa, I mean, the only thing that I can say for sure uh, is what was approved in the record of decision, which goes through or above Ala Moana Shopping Center, down the Kona Street alignment, up by Atkinson, down Kapiolani, past the Hawaii Convention Center, up University Avenue, and um, terminates over the H1 in basically lower campus, or the quarry, uh, for all the old timers who remember the quarry. Um, so that's, wh that's what's in the EIS, in the record of decision. Um, whether that still remains the most feasible or the, or the most prudent route, um, I think that remains to be seen because what will have to happen for our extension beyond the Ala Moana station is that we are going to have to do a supplemental environmental impact statement because by the time we get to the point where we're ready for design, uh, the EIS and record of decision will have been determined to have been stale or out of date, uh, which would require a revalidation or an update. And so what we would do, which is a part of um, I guess Council Member Ozawa's request in his budget request for some planning monies to do an alternatives analysis and public outreach uh, is to revisit or relook at what are some of those feasible options or alternative routes, uh, whether it's turning up P. Koi and going down Kapilani, whether it's continuing to go through or above Ala Moana Shopping Center, whether we turn down and go up Ala Moana Boulevard, all of those routes will need to be reevaluated again as a part of this supplemental EIS, um, but that is going to be at a future date. And, and so I wouldn't want, I, I would not be able to predetermine what is the route, but those are probable options. Yeah, I wasn't. I, 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 that wasn't my question. My question was just basically what you described, trying to figure out what the the scope of the the, the issues oh. are. And so was that part of the thinking in moving the station? more west? It, w it was it was a couple things. The first was 
uh, to be able to preserve uh, more options in how we could get uh, onto Kapiolani or, or get past uh, the, the Ala Moana Shopping Center. Um, by moving it further west allowed us to have additional opportunities because there are a few parcels that are currently not yet <coughs> developed that we would still have an opportunity to consider. Because uh, obviously once a building goes there, a tower goes there, it, it doesn't preclude, but it be makes it very expensive for that option. So uh, by moving it, it does uh, help preserve a number of additional options. But also moving it further towards the end also allowed us to look at much better um, circulation for the, the passengers getting on and off and the interface with the bus. Um, especially with the circulator, uh, with the handy van uh, being uh, much more uh, accessible at this at, at a at a different location or at, at the location that we ch have moved it to, um, so we have been working with with DTS on making sure that the move that we did make was going to be in fact a much better alternative, uh, not just for preserving you know, uh, our look going he ahead in the future for the extent for an extension but for just simply having better uh, transit integration at that location. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, uh, Brennan, thank you, Chair. Brennan, real quickly. So for the Alamoana location, I know it was moved, Eva of Kona Iki Street. Has that been put in the bid package for the bidders on the city center so that they now know where that station location is? That's been identified? Yes, yeah, so, the, so the, the general concept of it, the, the the preliminary design is there. Um, we haven't we haven't started any uh, additional design to the point where some of our other stations are at. So, but the, that location and the general concept of the layout has been provided. And if any changes were to be made, we we could make that through addendum before uh, we get them into their proposal phase. Yeah, and I and I did listen to the city council questions over um, over the media. And it did seem that that uh, Council Member Ozawa was very interested in whether or not we had made a decision on on siting, which impacts the DTS decision about circulator buses and Kona Street buses and, and handy bands. So I'm happy to know that we did put the location in the RFP for the city center section. For for the west side, I understand that we were able to do the columns by taking away some travel lanes. Uh, but what happens when you get into the city center phase and you've got like Halikawila, where you've got a, you know, portions of it are one way, portions are two way, but if you're doing work in street or you're doing straddle bents, are we going to actually interrupt businesses and are you reaching out to those businesses at this time to find out how their customer base accesses those businesses and what the interruption is going to be? Are we doing that now? Yeah, well, so, so we can also get more into that in our project 102 east side presentation also, um, because that'll be a part of it. Um, but the, the short answer to your question, Member Formby, is yes. Um, we've started some of that outreach. Obviously, it's still somewhat preliminary. Uh, so, so the level of outreach has not been into the level of detail that we will be getting into. But some of that initial outreach has begun. Uh, some of those other surface streets I think that the primary focus has been on the larger arterials like Dillingham um, and ensuring that we have uh, sufficient capacity, especially during the peak hours. And some of the other surface streets like Halikuila, <coughs> Queen, Kona, mm -hmm. uh, when we get to those areas, there will probably be much more significant closures um, because those roads are even far more narrow. I mean, it's two lanes with parking. So we will have to work with uh, DTS and the, and the businesses and the residents in the area to find a way where we can maybe uh, shift traffic, but also look at possibly restricting parking on the streets for us to be able to utilize a workspace. Um, or uh, you, you limit access for local traffic only or something like that. Yeah, those, so I don't think any of those decisions have been made because we're still kind of working out some of the uh, traffic management plans for the areas. Uh, and, and that's also part of the responsibility of the contractor com to come up with uh, that specific plan as well. And, and that, that has to be approved by a number of agencies as well. Yeah, and, and I understand that. And I guess that's really my concern is I know that 
that part of the, the traffic management plan, business mitigation plan is put into the design build contracts. But I also know that there's lead, you know, yes. long lead items that need to be handled by staff. And I want to make sure that, that you as an organization have the staff to start all that surveying and, and business contact that HCDA I think is going to expect us to do long before we ever get a city center contract in place with a business mitigation team. And if you need resources, you need to let us know. Absolutely, Because that's yes. got to be done. And we are looking to um, provide some of those uh, necessary resources through our CENI contract as well, uh, because they are pr they are primary boots on the ground type of people. Uh, so we are looking to do that. But, uh, and, and we've kind of talked about it in general terms, but we are trying to work on establishing that business assistance group that is uh, focused specifically on this business outreach, um, especially for the, the East. And we are partnering a little bit more with SBDC in trying to have them bring on uh, an additional person specifically dedicated to the East. Okay, thank you. Thank you, any Chair. Any other? Yeah. Um, uh, on, on that uh, business mi uh, mitigation thing, I've, ha I've received some um, complaints from developers who are currently developing, so not existing businesses, but bus uh, businesses that are in the process of uh, constructing uh, about, uh, you know, the insufficient coordination uh, of uh, heart rail con uh, construction and their project construction, whether it be uh, utility relocations and some opportunities for where maybe they could cover some of the costs of utility relocation right. if they knew what heart schedule and designs were. And so, um, I, you know, I'm going to be uh, make, setting up meetings with uh, Dan to do, do a little more coordination, but if in, in your planning for business mitigation, it includes uh, pending projects because uh, there's uh, the pending projects for every large construction project we do require a construction management plan that um, has to deal with the circulation around it and so that will that needs to interface with hearts plans and so yeah to please uh, you know be aware of these <coughs> especially the larger projects will, will have a site and uh, area circulation impact so sure and we, we always do look for opportunities to uh, share costs with contractors because we do get um, savings in economies of scale, um, as well as we don't, we don't like seeing developers put improvements in only to have us tear it back up or vice versa. And so we try and see if we can share those opportunities. Um, so yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah. Um, sorry for taking so much time, but I... <laughs> That's fine. I, I think, you know, again, at the um, the council meeting and also in the, the, the briefings with the individual council members, um, I, I thought that the issue that was raised by the council um, dealing with the um, HECO um, relationship and issues, and I thought the discussion had at the full open um, um, budget committee meeting of, of the council and your um, brief explanation was very enlightening, so I thought it would be helpful to for the, for, for the full board and the view and audience to hear that again. If you don't sure. mind, for a few oh, short times. Absolutely. Time. And I think we're going to be the doing wanting to move us along. Sure. I, and I think we're going to be doing this again at, at another project oversight meeting that's going to be scheduled in the near future to talk specifically about utilities and, and HECO. Uh, but yeah, I, yeah, a lot of discussion has been going on uh, about Hart's relationship with HECO and our dealings with HECO. Um, it, really, it really comes down to two separate buckets. One is the east, one is the west. Um, on the east, uh, we have already made a decision to underground the 138s. It is already incorporated into uh, our procurement packages, so the contractor knows that they are undergrounding the 138s. The 46 and the 12 KV lines ha had always been in, in our design packages. Uh, the one thing that, the, the, the thing that was not included in our original design packages was the 138s, and because uh, that was primarily because Undergrounding 138s or, or dealing with the 138s is probably the most expensive aspect of the utility relocation package. And so if there was another way to try and deal with the 138s that was going to save us money, 
uh, and still be acceptable to HECO in terms of the operations of their facility, uh, we, we wanted to take some time to do that, which, which we did. Um, but exploring other things like hanging the 138s on top of the, or underneath the guideway, uh, relocating it on to another road, like maybe King Street or something, is that, was that feasible? Um, or looking at other alternatives like equipment, uh, we went through the whole gamut of, of that exercise um, and just because of the, the physical limitations of Dillingham. I mean, we're already widening Dillingham because we need to preserve the two lanes in each direction and be able to have a median for our columns in the middle. Uh, we're, so we're already widening it as much as we can until we start hitting buildings and we don't want to be taking buildings. Um, so even with that, looking at the proximity to the 138s on both sides, uh, we knew it was going to be very, very difficult um, for HECO to fit la very large cranes to be able to lift and pick these large steel poles up or even just to access them for maintenance. So decision was made to underground, uh, which we have done. It is incorporated into our budget. We talked about the, the uh, 90 to $100 million that we uh, added to our budget uh, last year in order to accommodate both city center and airport uh, sections. So as far as the, the, west, I mean the east side, um, in terms of how to handle the, the 138s, uh, those decisions are, are, are kind of behind us. The only outstanding thing was uh, sequencing, whether or not uh, HECO's preference was that we were that we would underground and ener fully energized before we started putting up any guideway. Um, that was their preference. I don't know how practical it would have been for us in terms of of, of being able to maintain the schedule, uh, pushing everything out. So we we have had a lot of uh, discussions with them. Uh, I believe that we've gotten them to a, a point where they're comfortable enough where we can have some level or duration of overlap where we've already started to put guideway up uh, while the 130s are still up in the air and then we work to underground and energize them. And so I think we're, we're at that point where we're going to be now working with our contractors to work that sequencing in and make sure that undergrounding activities start from the very beginning and work concurrently with the rest of it. Plus that also helps with the other utility relocations as well because it's such a mess down there that you really can't separate the 138s from everything else and not have all these other conflicts. So putting it together uh, just makes sense and I, I think our contractors will, will be able to work a lot more effectively that way. On the west side, very different situation. We still have 138s um, uh, both on Kualakai Parkway and along Kameme Highway. We have 46 kV uh, down Farrington Highway as well as um, Kameme Highway and, and uh, Kualakai. But because Kamehameha Highway and Farrington Highway are much wider highways and we have a lot more right away to work with and the distances are a little bit more uh, uh, amenable to looking at other options, uh, equipment has become an option worth studying. And, and so what we did was we worked with HECO to bring in a new uh, bucket truck that uh, was identified by one of our consultants um, that could fit in a much smaller work zone or working clearance. Uh, we tested it out for a week on Farrington Highway, caused a lot of traffic because we had to shut down the road. Um, but I think at the end of the day, I think our results are, were, were very positive. We have the bucket truck for another two more months till the end of June, um, at which point we will be making final decisions with HECO on the use of that and, and our ability to uh, just leave the 46 kilovolt lines in as is, so that, and they will then in turn change some of their work practices and their working clearance requirements because this e equipment is now gonna be more feasible for them to, to do the work. Um, the 138 is another story. Um, I think the fact that this new equipment for the 46 kV line uh, worked so well, uh, it allowed HECO to feel comfortable with taking the next step and say, okay, let's look at maybe, the, we've identified two cranes, one Altec, one National Crane on the mainland uh, that could potentially work on Kamehameha Highway and maybe even Kualakai Parkway to handle their 138s. So we're gonna work with HECO on trying to set up a mock-up on the mainland to see if it actually might theoretically fit. And then if it does, we'll, we'll bring the, the crane over here to do some actual field uh, sampling and testing. And, and we'll, we'll go from there. And if that 
uh, is successful as well, that could also save us quite a bit of money in not having to underground or relocate or hang the 138s on Kamehameha Highway or Kolakai Parkway. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any other questions or comments? So, Brennan, just so that we're clear, you mentioned, and I want the public to be aware of this, that on May 24th at 5.30 at the Mission Memorial, the Project Oversight Committee of this board will meet uh, to talk about utilities, among other items of the agenda. So uh, for a more in-depth uh, analysis of it, that's where it will be. And we are doing it in the evening with the uh, new chair's concurrence and the committee member's concurrence because of the fact that we believe that this is the major issue facing HART and the construction costs. And that is something that we need to have so that the public can be can readily access us. Also, um, Dan, I, if you could, I'd like to see <laughs> what we're calling Transit 101 uh, be put on our website, in, at, at, like on the front page if possible, and people can both see the cute video <laughs> as well as all of your handouts, and that they can follow this. And because um, I think that uh, this is this is the first time we've actually done it systematically, except by our different sections that we go through. So if no one else has any other comments, thank you, Brennan. Thank you, and I look forward to giving Project 102. What, two, Project 200. <laughs> oh, we, 200. We kind of go up. Well, oh, you guys are graduating already. Yeah, yeah. Okay, 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 I got it. <laughs> okay. <coughs> the next is, um, oh. res oops, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, so Zomertrot. Thank you, that was very informative. Uh, Barbara Armitrop, for the record, I'm a member of Neighborhood Board 5, and that, that was really nice to see exactly where it's going. I was a little disappointed, though, because a lot of people go to Polymomi, and the station's gonna be at the opposite end of Pearl Ridge Center, and it's a long haul to walk from there all the way down to Sears, and that's where most people, disabled and elderly, go. But. Uh, I guess they'll be riding the handy van. <laughs> I, I predict though, because a lot of people on the handy van won't be able to ride the rail because of it not going to where they're gonna be going, that by time the rail's done, there's gonna be five to 7,000 more riders. There'll be at least 23,000 by 2022. I kind of predict that right now. I, I agree with Mr. Formby on whenever they do any of the traffic, when it gets into town, that they know ahead of time because definitely the handy van will have to let their drivers know where not to go down and what to avoid because the vans are late now. And if they get stuck in any of that traffic over in there, it's gonna be twice as long. A week ago Friday, I waited from two in the afternoon to five o'clock to get from Yacht Harbor Towers to St. Louis Heights. I did not get a pickup. So I think even the carriers for the handy van, they need to reach out to like the cab and uh, Echo and let them know so they can let all their drivers know too where all the traffic is going to be. And even now, because they do go out, they do go out to Waianae, Mililani, they take a lot of rides. And I think that's a lot of the holdup on why the handy van is late now. So if they can still keep reaching out to the other tra the transportation that takes handy van. So, uh, and basically on that also, I believe too with the new rail cars, maybe you could have like Ho'opono come out with the, um, the blind people because they're coming on with canes and usually when you get on a bus, you sit down right away. There's somebody to ask where you can sit and they're gonna be coming on and I'm not sure where these uh, strollers are gonna be, these um, uh, coolers, and they're gonna be walking on and they're not gonna know what they're gonna be hitting. I, I just suggested that because I was talking to my friend Rose regarding that and she didn't wanna come up to say it so I said I would. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions of Ms. Armitrot? Not, thank you very much. We're moving on to item number seven which is resolution number 2016-15. Uh, this is Jesse Suki and this is a 
approving notification to the city council of intention to acquire guideway easement over on and across rural property mr suki good afternoon chair board members uh, this is a brief slide about the property that we're um, talking about um, by the way my name is jesse suki i'm the director of planning permitting and right-of-way So we always start off with uh, where we're at in the process. Um, so we're seeking your approval today to submit this to council. And if council acts uh, once they receive it or don't act or object within 45 days, um, then we would um, come back for your authorization to file um, and uh, submit it. Um, you know, I got that a little bit confused, I'm sorry. Morris usually does this, but. <laughs> so after this process, um, we would put notice in the newspaper if council doesn't object or they approve. And um, before we actually filed in court, we'd come back to you um, for that approval. And so this is the, uh, the landowners uh, according to the title search uh, and the TMK for the property. Um, we're taking a 511 square foot strip here along Hale um, The cross street is South Street. Um, this is in the city center area um, in Kaka'ako. The property is uh, currently vacant, in the bottom right hand corner. So we're, we're asking for uh, permission for starting um, potentially eminent domain because um, as you know we may not file we may settle before we have to file um, but we've been working with the land order our agents have been um, we've made a letter of offer um, they've going, been going back and forth on the agreement and um, in our last most transaction um, we weren't able to get any approval of the acquisition document um, the easement transaction and so given the timeline and um, the need for the parcel, um, it's um, important that we start the eminent domain process now. And that's all I have about this. Any questions? Any questions, members? Mr. Lee. So Jesse, wh what is the hang up? Why, why are you guys having difficulty with this? Well, in this particular case, it's just that uh, the, the landowner hasn't responded timely and um, it's really more to do about the need for the parcel and you know there's a lead time to actually getting it to court and so we're starting this first step and there's you know two other approval steps to council and coming back to the board before we actually get to court if we need to so it's about a timing Time but, but what is the landowner's objection? I mean, are they, are they, is it valuation? Well, we, we, my agents went back and forth with them a couple times and uh, the last iteration of reviewing the agreement, um, they said that they, they'd like to bring on an attorney, which is fine. Um, but we've been working with them for a while, and it's only now that they're saying they want to bring on an attorney. So that sort of, you know, as a recovering attorney, I like to say that's going to start a whole different round of negotiation and transaction and add time to the process. But I mean, as far as the understanding with the landowner did the agents did our agents agree on the value so at this point it's hard to say because they seem to be okay with the value and so I, I've been briefed by my agents and they seem to be okay with the value so we're not sure why at this point they'd like to bring an attorney on and that's fine you know to protect their interest it just where we are at the acquisition process we, we need it we need to get the eminent domain started it may be a very quick turnaround you know the attorney might come on and say you know change some Boards and court council agrees and we sign off. Thank you. Any other questions? I just had a quick one. Mr. <coughs> so, so Jesse, when you when we look at the file, you know, it, it has it has the heart letters. And so I had the same question that board member Lee did. We get the heart letters and we get the appraisal, but we don't get it says there's a formal response received on December 9th, 2015. Do we get that? Or is there a reason we don't get that? Formal response received on December 9th. Well, that's what it says in the file here. 
received a formal response to the letter of offer on December 9th, 2015. We don't see it out. Yes, right, simple. and so that's how we developed the administrative settlement at that point. So the formal mm -hmm. response was that uh, there were in agreement with the value at that time. Yeah, but is the formal response in writing or is it oral? Um, it could be oral or it could be um, in writing, and we can get that uh, for you. Well, I'm just, uh, no, I guess my request would be is that if you get stuff in writing sure. that makes the record complete so when we review it, we see that we're asking we're, we're communicating with them, but we're not receiving something back. It would be good to know. But if oh. you get something in writing and you could put it in the file, then we would be able to read it and we'd know where the disconnect was or, or w where their position is. Sure. So I just don't know whether it was oral or it just says it was a formal response received. It's not in the file. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. That would help. Any other questions? You need a vote on this to authorize it? Yes. Yeah. So because it's going to be an item that we're going to vote on, is there any member of the public who would like to offer testimony on this? If not, members, uh, if someone would uh, make a motion to the effect of um, basically the authorizing the acquisition of the easement by eminent domain. So moved. So moved. Second? Second. Second. Any further discussion? If not, do we have unanimous consent on this? Yes. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> the next item is the uh, resolution number 2016-16 relating to the Hawaiian station naming policy of the Honolulu <laughs> Authority of Rapid Transportation, John Nauchi and Kobika Farm. Oh, it's just John? Eloha mai kako, e ka luna papa o ke uh, uh, papa o heart, heart board, chair, Hanabusa, and the other members of the heart board. Uh, my name is John Nochi, I'm deputy director of planning for heart, and I'm going to be talking a little bit more about some of the positive things that I think um, chair Hanabusa alluded to with the train unveiling. And um, what we'd like to do is talk a little bit about Hawaiian station naming for our program here. So. Um, we're really looking at creating forever place names. I know place names are very um, powerful things here in Hawaii. They tell stories. And so we want to make sure that we link to the past, we acknowledge the present, and we look to the future. So, but a little bit, I mean, if you'll indulge me, I'm a, I'm a transit guy. I spent 15 or 16 years at Oahu Transit Services um, working on the bus side. And why I really believe in transit is because I believe transit, it is transformative. and. The kind of transformation we're going to see with this rail alignment um, becoming live and active in the upcoming years is going to be something I think a lot of us can't even imagine yet. But I want to actually take us all the way back. I mean, I did talk about how place names are very vital and very important here. Um, Honolulu in trans, I mean, um, I'm sorry, transit in Honolulu is very old. Now, this isn't even a picture of the oldest transit we have, but this is about, I think it's about the 1940s. This is King Street. You can see uh, a couple of the buildings that we still can see nowadays are on King Street, and it's a Waikiki signed trolley car. And it runs along the same route alignment that our current Route 2 does. And so our early numbered routes in bus 1 and 2 are like that because they are the first and second routes that we did. So understanding that transit has had a really big impact on Honolulu is important here. But seeing as this was the 1940s, if you look on the very front right of the of the streetcar. Do you guys see that sign right there? I don't know if you guys can see it, but what it does say is park your auto safely at home. Use the streetcar service. <laughs> <laughs> so even back then, HRT was having, you know, a little bit of an issue with people wanting to use their cars. And you can kind of see the streetcar is holding up kind of a lot of traffic on King Street right now. Well, not, I mean, at that time. So I just kind of wanted to take you back to just show you how old transit is in Honolulu. In 1886, now this is when um, Hawaii had a monarchy in place at the palace across the street. The Hawaiian Tramways Company was granted a charter from the Kingdom of Hawaii. And so we had horse and mule drawn cars in Honolulu's downtown. I kind of want to point this out. In 1889, by 1889, after three years, they had 12 miles of track laid. So, I don't know, I mean, I, you, you could do things very quickly back then, I think especially with the help of the monarchy. But in 1898, the Honolulu Rapid Transit, the good old HRT that a lot of us remember, 
um, bought the rights to the tramways company and expanded and electrified the streetcar system. And Honolulu just began to grow beyond the bounds of downtown Honolulu that we, as we know it now. And I pulled a quote from the Honolulu Star Bulletin from 1923 that said, the service rendered by the Honolulu Rapid Transit Company is equal, if not superior, to that of any city. So we have a very rich transit history. And here is the map of that 12 miles. Now you can kind of see there is a lot of stuff going on around downtown Honolulu. But kind of what's interesting is you can see the gridded street network of um, Kaimuki off to the right side of the map there. And a lot of that Waikiki, Mo'ili'ili area was not built yet. But using transit as an influential piece of land use there, you can see the 12 miles of streetcar track we had kind of gave birth to this. Yeah, who would have thought, right? <laughs> you can see the huge urban densities of Honolulu there. So we go on to our more modern transit era in Honolulu with the bus. And the bus is a really good system. Um, city and county of Honolulu took over the transit in 1971. And the bus is one of the only transit systems nationally who have won the APTA, American Public Transportation Association Award, uh, twice. It's a well-utilized transit system, lots of daily riders, and a lot of um, annual riders. Now, we're poised now, as Brennan ex um, kind of explained a lot of the details of our new modern transit era in Honolulu with rail, to open a 20-mile alignment. And I know you guys are very familiar with the alignment that we have here, the 20, 20 miles and 21 stations here. But what we're really looking at is an opportunity. Um, each of those 21 stations have a lot of identity and representation. A lot of them fall in very individual and very um, unique ahupua'a. I know Brennan brought up the, the term ahupua'a, the land division from mountain all the way to the ocean. And each of those ahupua'a have a very certain characteristic. And in Hawaiian culture, people were recognized by their ahupua'a. Like I know now we say something like, oh, that, that guy, he really seems like he's from Maui. You know, the way they talk or the way they present themselves. But before, it was more on an ahupua'a basis. So we really look at this as an opportunity to really represent the 21 stations in the 21 communities that are going to be built around and modified and improved around our 21 rail stations. So Hart was very um, diligent in assembling a, a committee of, uh, of Native Hawaiian experts, cultural practitioners, language experts, and well-networked uh, members of the community to form a Hawaiian Station Naming Committee. And this is a draft mission statement that this committee will be working on. Um, the Hawaiian Station Naming Committee will rec recommend appropriate Hawaiian place names for the Honolulu Authority for Rapid Transportation's 21 stations using diverse community knowledge, oral accounts, and written history to bring to light forgotten place names, historic events, and significant sites in Hawaiian culture, which will shape our communities for generations to come. Now, the idea behind this and the motivation behind this is that these names are very powerful. And if I may draw on my transit experience from the bus, you know, we had a, in a car barn for the electrified streetcar system at Alapai Street, where the Alapai Transit Center is right now. So we're still holding on to that piece of transit history. People at the bus, I mean, even though we haven't had streetcars in years, still call it the car house. Where the ORNL line ended in Ivile, they still call that the junction. So you can see how these names persist on long after places are gone. Even in Hawaii, like people know that you know across the convention center, they still call it like Cocos or Aloha Motors or things that make no sense to someone who may have just moved here. So we have very enduring place names here. So we find that they are anchors and foundations of communities. So what we would encourage our committee of Hawaiian Station, um, people on the Hawaiian Station Naming Committee is to keep your eyes forward and backwards. Consider what happened there in the past. Consider what's happening there now consider what we want to happen there in the future. And so the Hawaiian Station Naming Working Group will investigate, develop, and propose 21 Hawaiian station names using their own personal knowledge, documented oral accounts, written <laughs> history, and you know, just maybe extending their network to network with people that they know who may be more ma'a to the, the history and culture of specific areas. So we've asked them to consider events that have happened near or at station sites Ely names, small land division names that occur in, um, in earlier in Hawaiian history. And just future goals and aspirations for the station sites. So that's going to be the task of the Hawaiian Station Naming Working Group. And I'm going to turn it over to our um, Hearts Cultural Planner, Kobiko Farm, to talk a little bit about the process that they're going to adhere to. Uh, hi, good afternoon. So 
Basically, in 2009, the uh, City Council passed a resolution that committed the project to having a Hawaiian name at each of the 21 stations. Uh, the policy before you guys is going to help us fulfill that commitment. Um, so as uh, John had mentioned, uh, a working group was formed uh, which would basically propose a Hawaiian station name for each of the 21 stations. Um, sorry. <clears throat> I just wanted to come because we have the same shirts. So. <laughs> <laughs> it was not a cheap sale, but. <laughs> so um, we actually uh, did an introductory meeting in February, basically to introduce the committee member to each other. Uh, and we have a plan in place that will uh, uh, further uh, explain to the working group. Um, so the, the, what the working group would do is they would propose a name um, after discussion amongst themselves based on the uh, all the research that was done as a result of the project in addition to the collective knowledge that they may also know. Uh, so we have an archaeological inventory survey, a traditional cultural property study. Um, all this knowledge and uh, resources can help, uh, I guess, influence potential Hawaiian names for each station. And ultimately what they will do is they will submit a proposal in the form of a report to Hart CEO for preliminary review. Uh, Hart CEO would then do an in initial review, uh, which would basically okay the proposal to solicit public input. So then we would then go and distribute these names to the public uh, via email to the neighborhood boards, uh, other interested stakeholders, the consulting parties uh, to the program agreement for the project. Uh, in addition to posting the names onto Hart's webpage for um, greater outreach and for further input. And we would do that for at least 30 days to allow the public an opportunity to su uh, submit comments and generate input. And as the committee members shared, uh, even potentially help bridge any gaps uh, with names that they propose that might, uh, I guess, give a greater understanding to, to some of the names that they might propose. Um, after those 30 days, the working group would then reconvene to really go over all the input that the uh, public may have submitted and, and uh, comments and, and review all those uh, input and then finalize their report uh, to Hart CEO. Once that report is final, Hart CEO would then present that report to the Hart board and ultimately the Hart board will uh, make a decision on the proposals that is in front of them. Uh, once that uh, decision is made. Uh, Hart would then, in the form of a letter, uh, list all the steps that went into vetting the names that was proposed and ultimately decided on, and inform the mayor's office and city council on what the Hawaiian station names would be for each station. And then ultimately, uh, once that happens, we would then present the name to the contractor who would order the names and then install them at each station. Um, after a lot of thought and consideration and consultation, um, ultimately this is the uh, working group that was uh, put together. Uh, so we have William Ayla, Peter Apo, Mahelani Seifer, Shad Kane, Misty Kela'i, Keone Kele Kolio, Ivan Louis Kwan, Pua Kea Nogle Meyer, and Hinale Moana Wongkalu. Uh, collectively and cumulatively, this group possess a wealth of knowledge that is more than capable of coming up with uh, appropriate and sensitive Hawaiian names for each of the 21 stations. And I feel we had a very productive Introduction, introductory meeting with this group. You know, a lot of times when you put a lot of um, people who have very um, strong opinions or strong manao, that you know you worry that everyone's going to get along. And it appears that we're, everybody got along very famously. It was very good. So we feel very confident with the group going forward. Um, so basically, that's about all I have. I mean, we really have come a long way. This is early transit. Guess where this is? This is here on this island. It's Waikiki. <laughs> before Waikiki kind of got built up to what we know it is to be now. So we have a couple mules and a horse, some street cars on rails. So we'll be much better than this. <laughs> <laughs> and so basically, the, um, I guess that concludes our presentation. Thank you. Members, any questions or comments? Do we need a, an action on this? It's a resolution. Oh, it's a resolution? Yeah. OK. Mr. I Hall. just want to commend you and uh, one question for Kavika. Uh, there will be extensive research and the well-qualified people that you folks have on, on that committee. I was just wondering if it shouldn't be extended into the TOD development area also. 
being based on the same theme and not having to reinvent the wheel. I, 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 I apologize. Uh, what, what, what did you ask me? If this concept and the research done for this project on the stations could be extended to the TOD development in and around the station because they're all located in the same area. Um, do you mind if I, I guess Kovika is more on the cultural side and uh, I can do more of the traditional planning stuff. So with the TOD, the transit oriented development side of it, um, Kavika did reference a traditional cultural properties study we did and it was a really extensive uh, study of properties that had kind of fallen out of recognition or have been forgotten over time. And that represented a full, the full 20 miles and a little bit more around our alignment. And um, I kind of just a point about, I'm gonna do a little humble brag here, but Hart actually recently was awarded with a commendation for that award from Historic Hawaii Foundation just for the breadth and the depth of that work. And um, a lot of those, those place names and those studies and the stories in the Mo'olelo and Wahipana that come out of that, um, they're available to the public. And I think a lot of, I, I know that people have expressed interest in knowing more about these places. So we can use these stories that were developed to um, influence the neighborhoods that develop around it. And I think some of that is happening in the Kaka'ako area right now. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Ata? Yeah. I would ask, uh, is that study being given to my TOD team? I don't know if we actually formally transmitted it, but we, we can do it. It's yeah. a really large study, so we can, we can mm -hmm. do it electronically. So maybe to take uh, Buzzy's idea, and but the TOD zones are really uh, not Hart's jurisdiction, but the city's jurisdiction. And so if you want to incorporate that information, I don't know. That, that yeah, and be, that it, would it be is the way to do it. It is available on our website, and okay. we would actually love for nothing more than for people to take that information and use it. You know, I think we read through it recently, and we reviewed it. You know, and gave it a, a much closer look, and it, we were just amazed by some of the stories that that are in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the other thing. This is not exactly. Um, I mean, it's a related thing, but. In, in your studies, like uh, when the mayor and I visited Naha in November, we were given a ride on the monorail system there. And as we approached each station, there was a song associated with the station that started to go on the, the train's PA system. It, it was, you know, so it identified what station you were coming at too, but it also gave a little cultural addition of a, with us. Song. So, if, if in your study uh, of the Molelo and as they come to this train station, it would, you know, ring a, a song about that place. I, I think that would be a nice kind of touch. Yeah, we'll, something to consider. We will definitely um, consider that. We we are um, looking at ways to increase our um, our breadth of um, educational and interpretive materials for each region. And, and actually, uh, yeah, we are. Uh, developing stipulation seven of the programmatic agreement, which uh, as John mentioned, touches upon educational and interpretive opportunities, uh, where we will further, I guess, uh, tell more stories associated with each area, highlight the different cultures in each area, uh, involve the different uh, groups and community of the community in each area to really see, uh, I guess, what would be the appropriate message that can kind of go into each station as part of the educational and interpretive program of the programmatic agreement. Me. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, John, in in Hart, where does is where does this program sit? Does this sit in the culture and arts program, or where does it sit in the organization? Currently, it sits in planning. Um, planning. planning does have some responsibility, or actually, a, a large responsibility to the cultural aspects of our project. Yeah, because I wondered how the name would also. I mean, playing off what Member Ata was asking about, and and uh, Member Hong as to the station, the art and public transit program, and whether or not the art is in turn related to the station naming. And I hope that there's a bigger vision for all of this so that when somebody arrives at a station, there's a sense of place, and it's associated with the name and the music and all of that kind of stuff. So I hope that's true. That's, uh, that's definitely true. And um, to, to kind of go back to something that Brendan presented earlier, the, the wraps around the columns, those actually represent 12 panels. So it's uh, basically four across and three down. Each of those things compo is a composite, I mean, well, it makes a larger picture and a mural. And all of those are defined very specifically with wind names, rain names, mele. 
symbolic plants and um, animals and just um, basic symbology of that ahupua of that that station district and we will be using some of that with the Hawaiian Station Naming Group. They've been very interested in knowing what each of those 12 are at every station so that they can give due honor to it. Okay, and the last thing is I know in the past, I, I remember Board Member Horner talked about station naming rights and the possibility of there being income associated with station names. And so are there potentially two names for a station? Is there a commercial name and then there's a, a cultural name or what's, what's going on there? Well, we will be looking at that. I mean, transit systems around the world do look at, I mean, uh, recognize that as a large potential source of, of income, and we will be addressing that at a later time. Yeah, and, and I would just add, um, there we, we are contemplating that each station will have the primary Hawaiian name and then what we're calling a secondary place name or opportunity that you just described. And we'll come back to the board um, with um, further recommendations, but there may be some opportunities for uh, folks who may want to actually name the station, you know, something um, in, in addition to the Hawaiian name. Uh, or the secondary name could just be something as simple as uh, uh, a, a more common locator um, to the to the people might be familiar with, you know, a particular neighborhood or a street crossing or something like that. So we'll, when we present back the, um, uh, the recommendations from the committee for the board's approval, then we'll also include some of that information as well. Good, thank you. Any other comments? Um, Our member. Yeah. <laughs> well, two, yes. two, two things, Madam Chair. One is um, um, I offer myself to you to recuse myself from being on the membership of the European Group if you, if you so choose to replace me. On that? Group? Yes. Why would I do that? I uh, would. I would. <laughs> <laughs> I would recommend, uh, and it, it's no basis other than the fact that I don't know if, if you will get a per diem or anything like that. If you not vote, <laughs> no. So the rest of us can affirm you on that group. Um, in the, the meeting we had, um, I indicated that that the rep that the that I as a person from the Hort board would not be voting, um, but I'd just be a resource person, so that they don't because eventually they're going to come back to the board, and they got a really great group of, of people there. So that's one thing. The second thing is, <clears throat> to the extent that we're going to entertain this resolution, mm -hmm. I would. Um, recommend some modification of the language okay. um, the what the language says now is on the resolution um, um, well, why don't we move to the point where we actually uh, are moving to vote for oh. you to amend okay I'll, um, I'm you want me to move yeah uh, well, is there any other questions or comments member uh, members of the public because this is a voting issue <coughs> anyone wish to address that we do have someone okay Rose Okay, I'm Rose Poe. For the record, um, I think this is a very good idea for the stations because I'm visually impaired. If they play music or they say a Hawaiian name, then we kind of know where we're at. And I, when you guys were talking about it, I said, that's the greatest thing you guys could do for a blind. So. That's thank you. thank you. Any questions of Rose? Not, thank you very much. Anyone else <coughs> wishing to? Barbara, are you just standing to let Rose in? No, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara Amitra. <laughs> Barbara Amitra, I'm a member of Neighborhood Board 5, but I'm speaking as an individual. I've ridden on subways. Uh, my first one was in Tokyo, France, New York, London and the BART extensively. Um, on the naming, I'm with the Hawaiian names, but I still think part of the location like uh, West Oahu, University of Hawaii, I still think that should kind of be in on it. Because if you go uh, Hawaiian Airlines station, blah, 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 and then that station, there's a lot of people here that don't even speak English or speak broken English. They would know the location because you've always said where these stations are going to be. So like uh, Kapolei, you know, all those different ones. Because there might be, you know, you're stuck in the middle standing up and you're going, oh, my station's next by if they announce where the station's coming. Because a lot of people 
we're going to have to get used to the Hawaiian name for that station. So that's all I'm saying if it goes into naming or having corporate something to it. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Almatrot. Any questions of Barbara Almatrot? Not? Thank you very much. Anyone else who comments on this? If not, members, any further discussion? If not, uh, I will entertain a motion on this. Okay, I'll, I'll make a motion to approve uh, resolution 2016-16 with the following um, amendment to the, the, uh, the document in front of us. Uh, the document in front of us um, on the now therefore section says on number two, the Hort Board of Directors shall approve the station Hawaiian station names from proposals put forth by the working group. I think it, um, it doesn't, what, what concerns me about that language is almost as though the board has no discretion and just has to approve whatever is submitted. And I'm sure that's not the intent. Um, and so what I would suggest as a modification of that first sentence um, um, is the following language. The working group shall recommend to the, uh, shall recommend Hawaiian station names to the Hort Board of Directors for approval. Okay. Is there anyone who um, objects to that amendment? Not, can we have a second to, I guess you, we technically didn't second your first. No, I, I, no, I just, what I did is I, I, I created my own. You created your own. <laughs> okay, so we, we, have a, we have actually a new resolution. So is there a second? Two. Second. There's a second. <laughs> Any further discussion, members? Not. Do we have a unanimous consent on that? Is there yes. any problems with the form at all? Hmm? Yes, Jesse. Sorry, the one to interrupt your decision making, but are you just changing the first sentence? We're keeping the list of final names. Of yes. Okay. Just the first sentence. The second sentence will remain. Are you okay with that, Jesse? Yeah, no, no, I mean, <laughs> are you okay? You understand yes. what he's doing? Yes. Okay. And you understand what we did? Yes. We just did. Okay. I, I think we had unanimous consent on that, yes. members. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. John, totally unrelated. I want you to know that I'm probably the only member of this board who was there when APTA award was given to the bus twice. That's right. Yeah. So I, I, I worked under um, Jim Cowan at the time. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I went twice, <laughs> both <laughs> times. <laughs> yes, it got a great award, the bus system. Thank you. Are you leaving too? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, members, uh, we are, if, is there anyone else who has to leave? Because with the <laughs> removal, everyone has to be here or we lose form. One, two, three, so we six. need Buzzy to come. Yeah, Buzzy. Oh, Buzzy will be back. Yeah, we need Buzzy to come back. I'll stay for the conference. Do you want to keep going? Okay. I can stay 10 more minutes. Okay, what? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. That's all right. He'll Too stay 10 more minutes. Okay. Thank you. And Buzzy will be back by then. Okay, the next item, members, is the um, dissolution of the Fair Policy Permitted Interaction Group and the formation of a new Fair Policy Permitted Interaction Group due to the change in uh, membership. What, what we have is um, <coughs> basically we have to, in order for us to continue with the respective pigs and to add anyone to the pig itself, we are going to have to dissolve those that existed before and basically reformat them or pass them again. So that's what we're going to be doing with the next series of pigs. And I have the, um, for most part, the identical people on it. There may be some of you that I've moved to different uh, pigs, but we will have to do this by motion because the pig is a formation of, uh, of an act of the, the body. As we all know, the formation of the pig is a exemption to the um, Sunshine Law. It's allowed as long as it is not a majority of the members, and especially a majority of the voting members. So the pig that was considered to be the quote, the, the fair policy pig, is it was in process of investigating fur box recovery ratios, alternative sources of revenues, and really had not completed its investigation. So the new pig will continue the investigation where the current pig has left off, and the scope of the pig will be 
exactly as we had it before. I would like to recommend that this is how we will, the present, the current fair pig members are Michael Forby, Ivan Louis Kahn, and myself. And we would like to uh, add Terence Lee to the pig. We can have one more person if, one, two, three, four, one more person, if another person is interested in fair. The other Terry, are you interested in fairs? I have governance. Oh, you have. Anyone else? If not, um, this is the motion that I will need. So I will read the motion and somebody can so move. So I move to dissolve the fair policy pig and create a new fair policy pig and appoint Michael Formby, Ivan Louis Kwan, Colleen Hanabusa, and Terrence Lee as members of the pig and have, to, um, and have the new pig pick up where the old pig left off. The scope of the investigation of the pig, don't you love this? <laughs> will be to investigate Investigate the fair box recovery ratios and alternative sources of revenues. All pig members are authorized to participate in meetings about this issue and to assist in preparing an oral written report to the full board with the pig's finding and recommendation as to the heart's fair policy. As you know, under the law, when the pig has completed its work is when a report has to be presented to the board and voted on and technically the old pig hasn't completed its work. So it's my understanding, Corporation Council has approved this, that this is the process that we use. So is there someone who would be willing to make the motion as I stated? So oh, wait, wait a minute. We, we can't vote because oh, I need uh, one six. more. Six. Yeah, we need one more. Oh, we do need one more. We, we need one more. Can need six on everything. Oh. Yeah. He makes should have Yeah, he makes quorum, but we can't <laughs> go. <laughs> oh. We can't eat. We can't move. So, yes. Go on to the next can, one. Can I? Can, there shouldn't be a problem with me going through it without taking the vote. Yeah. Right. Okay. okay. So let, let's, let me just defer that vote, uh, but remember the motion because uh, somebody has to make that motion again. I mean, just move. Mm -hmm the contents of it. The next one is the dissolution or reformation of the updated financial plan pig. So as we all know, this was the pig that was created earlier this year to look at the basically the financial issues that we were dealing with um, and all the related construction matters that were related to that. So due to the advice of the Office of Information Practices, OIP, it is recommended that the current updated financial plan PIG be dissolved and a new one created with current and new members. The current PIG was in the process of investigating and updating the financial plan and really had not completed that investigation. The new PIG will continue the investigation where the current PIG left off and the scope will be exactly the same. If you remember, this was the pig that we were talking about at the last meeting, and uh, we're going to add the Damien to the existing numbers, but you really can't do that under the, the interpretation of OIP. So the current fair pig members are Michael Formby, Ivan, Ivan Louis Kwan, uh, myself, Terry Fujii, and we would uh, add Damien Kim to that list. So that's the and the motion would read something like, I move to dissolve the updated financial plan pig to create a new updated financial plan pig to appoint Michael Formby, Ivan Louis Kwan, Colleen Hanabusa, Terry Fuji, and Damian Kim as members of the pig and have the new pig pick up where the old pig left off. The scope of the investigation of the pig will be to investigate and update the financial plan. All PIG members are authorized to participate in meetings about these issues and to assist in preparing an oral written report to the full board with the PIG's finding and recommendation as to Hart's updated financial plan. So when we come back in with the appropriate number, somebody can still move. Okay. The next PIG uh, is a new PIG. Um, and this is the formation of uh, a pig for the purposes of board policies and governance. So we're calling it board policies and governance pig. What this, uh, what this needs is the scope of this pig 
is to investigate potential changes to the board's policies and governance structure, which really is we do have rules. So in the context of the present charter and with the uh, caveat members that we have to watch this simply because the charter, as you know, will be going through an amendment. I am told that um, we may hear about it by next, whenever, by Monday, potentially, what the Charter Commission may be doing. So all members, similar language, are authorized to participate in a meeting about this issue and to assist in preparing uh, any oral, oral written report on this. Very similar language. So this is to investigate the potential changes in the board's policy and governance structure. The next pig is to um, formation of the utilities pig. So this is basically uh, will be to explore resolution regarding Hawaiian Electric Company and other utilities because we do know that we still have a major issue on that. So the pig members who would be authorized here, oh, by the way, I'm sorry, on the governance pig, it would be Ivan Louis Kwan, Terrence Lee, myself, Michael Formby, and uh, Colbert Matsumoto. On the utilities pig, it would be Damian Kim, Ivan, no, I think Ivan is not on this no. one, um, and Terry is, Terrence Lee is on the other one. This one will be Ford Fujigami, Colbert Matsumoto, um, uh, myself, and Michael Formby. This is the the uh, utilities one. Okay. So I saw Buzzy. Buzzy there right you there. are, Buzzy. Was notably absent. Yes. <laughs> 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 we could not vote without you, Buzzy. You just wanted to feel important, yeah. <laughs> okay. So members. Let's start, uh, Buzzy, while you were uh, gone, what we were talking about was the fact that we are... Hello? If you need me on the fair pig, I can be on the fair pig then, since that'll tie in with the financial plan pig. Oh, no, you are on the financial plan pig. Yeah, I, but you asked me if I wanted to be on the fair pig? Yeah. So, if you, yes, I yeah. would be on the okay. fair pig. Okay, good. So, Buzzy, what, was, what we're talking about is that because we have to rechange the, the composition of the various pigs that we have, we are actually um, moving on that. And these were the various pigs that we were, we were talking about as we, and we're adding people on to the respective pigs. So, the one that we are first one up is the dissolution and reformation of the fair policy pig. That one is uh, we're supposed to talk about whatever uh, was uh, how to set the process of investigating fair box revenue ratios and the alternative sources of revenues. And the current members are Mike Formby, Ivan Louis Kwan, um, Terry Lee, Terry Fujii. Would you like to be on that pig? No man. Okay. <laughs> I learned a long time ago in the service never to bow it. Yeah. All right. <laughs> now that's an honest answer. So I guess I'm still on that one <laughs> and myself. <coughs> so we went through all the motion structure. And so members, um, will somebody move to dissolve the fair policy pig, create the new fair policy pig with the composition that I read off? And the scope will be to investigate fair, fair box recovery ratios and alternative sources of revenues. And all PIG members are authorized to participate in meetings about these issues and to assist in preparing an oral or written report to the full board with the PIG's finding and recommendation as to the Hearts Fair policy. Someone so moved. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Holm. Mr. Kim seconds. Mem members, any discussion on this? Members of the public, any discussion? Sorry, I forgot to ask you. Uh, none? So members, do we have unanimous consent on that? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you very much. So the next one is the dissolution and reformation of the updated financial plan, uh, plan pig. Uh, members of the public, anyone wishing to discuss that? 
If not, um, again, the current members are Mike Formby, Ivan Louis Kwan, Colleen Hanabusa, Terry Fujii, and the new member will be Damien Kim. <coughs> So members, may I have a similar kind of uh, motion on this one? We read it prior. So moved. Terry Fujii moves and Terry Lee Second. seconds. <laughs> Any further discussion members? If not, do we have unanimous consent on that? Yes. We do, thank you. The next one is the formation of the board policies and governance pig. This is a new pig. And this pig is to investigate potential changes to the board's policies and governance structure. There will be, a, there will be a major focus on this pig of the rules of the board. People may not know we have rules, but we really do have rules. And it will be in the context, of course, of the existing charter. Uh, we all know that uh, the Charter Commission may amend our governance structure, and we'll have to cross that bridge when we come to it as to whether we have to create a new pig after that to, to uh, take into account their changes. However, this is on the present, what we're dealing with now, which is the charter as it now stands. So the composition of this pig would be uh, Ivan Louis Kwan, Terence Lee, uh, myself, Michael Formby, and Colbert Matsumoto. Any discussion members? May I have a motion to that effect? So moved. So moved by Damien Kim. Second. Second by Buzzy Hong. Any further discussion? If not, may I have unanimous consent on that? All right. All right. Thank you. The final pig that's being created, this is also a new pig, it's the formation of what we're calling the utilities pig. Uh, this is to create basically a Hawaiian electric company <coughs> and utility relocations pig. The members uh, who have expressed an interest on being on this pig <coughs> is uh, Damien Kim, Ford Fujigami, uh, myself, Michael Formby, and Colbert Matsumoto. Any um, this further discussion? If not, can I have a motion? And basically, it also includes the standard language. Is the scope of the investigation. The PIG will be to explore resolution with regard to Hawaiian Electric Company and other utilities. All PIG members are authorized to participate in meetings about this issue and to assist in preparing an oral written report on the f to the full board with the PIG's finding and recommendation as to the resolution of matters pertaining to HECO and other utilities. <coughs> Can I have a motion? So moved. A motion by Ivan Louis Kwan. Second. Second, yeah. Second by Terry Fujii. Any discussion members? If not, may I have unanimous consent on this? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. So we took care of <laughs> items 9, 10, 11, and 12. Item 13, thank you, Morris. Item 13, and members, um, we are exactly at the minimum number for both quorum as well as voting. So if anyone has to leave, uh, please give us enough time <laughs> so we know. So we are item 13, fiscal year 2017 business plan draft review. Is that Ron Tober? Ron? Volume. Hello? somebody there. Hello. There you go. Hello. How are you? I'm okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. Thank you. All right. Mr. Tober, you are on via, um, I guess, what would we call this? Via telephone? <laughs> Speaker phone. <laughs> With the heart board, this is Colleen Hanabusa. Present uh, on the board level is Terry Fujii, Terry Lee, Damian Kim, Ivan Louis Kwan, and Buzzy Hong. So if you don't mind, if you could proceed with your presentation of the fiscal year 2017 business plan draft review. Well, thank you, uh, Chair Hanabusa and members of the board. Uh, thank you very much. I'm honored to be able to present to you 
the uh, draft uh, fiscal 17 business plan. I want to thank you for the opportunity to once again work with the agency to do that. Um, I'd like to thank the board members for the time they spent speaking to me and sharing with me you know, their ideas, concerns, and priorities. And I also want to express my appreciation to all the HART staff that worked with me to put together HART's sixth annual business plan. I have a presentation uh, that will take about uh, 15 minutes or so to go through if we could uh, get the first slide up on the screen. We, and then it's go up. To the um, outline of the business plan chapters itself. It's up. 2017 business plan chapters. Uh, the chapters are six chapters and four uh, appendices for the document, similar in structure to all the previous uh, heart business plans, a little bit change in the order. Uh, the focus of my presentation will be on the highlights and work program sections, but I will tell you that uh, we've made some ch changes in the business strategy section and slight changes in the organizational development strategy section based upon feedback and input that we received from board members in particular. I also need to note that the financial strategy and plans and budgets chapter uh, is based upon the fiscal 2017 budget that you submitted to the, uh, to the city. Next slide, please. First, uh, let me talk a little bit about agency status in general. Uh, at present, at least, uh, you have no new litigation that's been filed against the, the project or the agency. Uh, you have strong support <coughs> continuing from uh, the federal government, uh, more funding uh, to come. Uh, you have a continued high interest in transit-oriented development uh, all along the alignment. Uh, the approval this past year of uh, getting the GET tax extension does provide the agency with some financial stability to hopefully be able to finish the project. There are, of course, big challenges and risks, the continuing escalation of construction costs, and as you've noted here in the meeting, utility relocations are potentially a big issue uh, for the organization. The current cost estimate is at $6.8 billion. That's, been, that's the re-estimate uh, that's pending an update, depending upon what happens with the major construction contracts that you have coming up. Schedule changes have been necessary because based upon the, what's happened the past couple of years, the now target date for interim operations is 2019 and for full operations in 2020. Next slide, please. Project status itself during 2016 as we're ending the current fiscal year. Uh, at this point in time, or by the end of June, the project will be rough, roughly 45% complete. You'll have seven miles of guideway up with uh, track installed over 4.5 of those miles. Contracts have been awarded for the nine west side stations and the repackaging that was done by the agency saved uh, some $38 million as a result of that uh, effort. The rail operations center is basically completed. You've taken delivery of your first train set, which is presently in testing out at the rail operations center. Um, you have, I want to make special note of this, an outstanding safety record to date on the project. Uh, that number that you see on the screen is uh, a fantastic effort, particularly with the project working in some of the construction areas that you have. Property acquisition is continuing. Right now, it looks like uh, you're tracking at around $7 million under budget. Utility relocations are underway, as uh, Brennan was talking about earlier uh, in his presentation. And to date, um, you've uh, created some 1,550 jobs, 63% uh, of which are local. Now, there is one thing I forgot to include on this slide, and that is that uh, the agency has entered into a number of cooperative agreements with other entities, specifically HDOT, UH, and ECO. Uh, all of those agreements are going to, I think, cooperative agreements, partnering agreements, are going to end up saving some money, saving uh, time, and also uh, saving, um, uh, you know, additional disruption to adjacent uh, properties. And frankly, um, I think it's a great, a great accomplishment uh, by the, the heart leadership and the leadership of those organizations, which includes, in the case of HDOT, one of the heart board members, uh, Ford Fujigami. Next slide, please. Project status uh, continuing, uh, financial management. Uh, of course, we've, I've already mentioned the extension of the uh, GET tax uh, to 2027 was approved during the year. 
Um, there is now $1.31 billion worth of federal funding that has been in com committed by congressional action, actually received about $573 million, um, $1.38 billion in GET collections to date. Uh, the GET collections, while they may look a little bit better, are still running behind the original projection done in the 2012 financial plan. Uh, you did get a clean financial audit. There was one specific finding uh, related to Davis-Bacon, uh, the uh, prevailing wage act, uh, and the fact that uh, some contractors are not making timely submissions. And now staff has taken an action to uh, deal with that, and I think that, uh, that situation is under control. Short-term cash flow issues, um, it will be needing to issue some debt, and I'll talk more about that here in a minute. And you have a very comprehensive owner's controlled insurance program in place, which uh, protect the agency and contractors against uh, risks that might develop during construction. DOD planning is underway at all stations, and the activities continue on planning for future uh, rail operations. Uh, and one of the things that I think that was accomplished by the agency during the year working with DTS uh, was the decisions that were made on creating a joint bus and rail fare collection system and the procurement and award of a contract for smart card technology and bus card readers, which I think is a great, great accomplishment. Next slide, please. One of the things, uh, there were things I heard from board members in particular that uh, uh, results in having the, within the business plan a, a citation of some top priorities for the coming fiscal year. And they're listed here on, on uh, this particular slide. Cost containment, of course, and change order oversight are particularly important given the cost escalation environment the project uh, is existing in right now. Risk mitigation, dealing with the risks uh, uh, that exists, particularly in the utility, utility area. Maintaining uh, as close as possible schedule adherence uh, so you don't incur any delay costs associated with that. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly, enhanced communications and transparency for the project, which is uh, something I know that uh, the staff and the board are very much engaged in right now. Next slide, please. In the 2017 work program, uh, during the year, you'll have construction underway on all nine of the west side stations. By the end of the year, 10 miles of the guideway will be in place, and you'll have track installed over that length, and systems installation work will be well underway uh, by the end of 2000, fiscal year 2017. Uh, need to complete utility relocations, in, including into the airport segment of the alignment. Uh, you obviously will take full occupancy of the Rail Operations Center, and you will take delivery of your second train set. You need to advance the fare collection system final design work. That will be particularly important, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, one of the key goals that I know the staff has is to make sure that you achieve 100% contractor access to all properties that are needed for construction. That will be particularly important to avoid schedule delays and the costs related thereto. And also, accordingly, to obtain the necessary permits, in particular for the airport and center city sections. Need to continue or will be continuing to monitor the presence of Eva Kapuna and also any uh, monitoring permits to make sure that uh, contractors and others are complying with the requirements. Uh, and then finally, and perhaps most significantly, um, to award the remaining construction contracts on the project. Next slide, please. Those contracts uh, are shown here on, on, this, on this particular slide. They include to the two big ones, uh, the airport guideway and stations uh, design build contract, which is uh, in procurement process now. And, uh, with it will be hopefully completed very shortly with the identification of a selected firm to build that particular section of the alignment. The Center City Guideway and Stations Design Build Contract, which is also out on the street right now, and bids are due, or proposals, I should say, are due uh, in the fall. And then there are two park and ride lot uh, contracts that you'll be looking at in the coming year, park and ride lots for the UH West Oahu Station and for the East Kapolei Station. And of course, there is the Pearl Highlands Garage, and making a determination on the P, or rather not P3 is feasibility, and then a resulting contracting strategy for that particular important part of the garage, or I mean of the of the project. Next 
slide, please. Continuing on with the 2017 work program in the project management area, the staffing level proposed in the 2017 budget is 139 positions. That's the same level of staff for the past four years. The update of the Hearts financial plan has already been referenced by the chair, um, and that will need to be done and reflect the latest cost and revenue estimates. Uh, staff will be working with the FPA on that as time goes on, and as you see what comes in on the major construction contracts to be awarded. A continued emphasis on safety and security is provide priorities during construction. Following up on the audit report's recommendation, staff has things planned in that regard or underway, including things like updating the current policies and procedures and the contract administration policies and procedures. And staff will be issuing or formalizing the issuance of a quarterly change order report. There'll be staff training in some key areas, as is indicated there, and continued efforts to increase disadvantaged business enterprise participation in the project. Next slide, please. During 2017, the board and the staff will be working to, uh, with the key stakeholders, including the city and city council and the FDA, and making several major policy decisions, as is shown on this particular slide. So again, the financial plan update must occur at least by the mid, mid part of two, fiscal year 2017 or around the, the uh, change from uh, calendar year 2016 into 2017. Make a final decision, as I've already noted, on the Pearl Highlands parking garage, including the feasibility of a public-private partnership. Key fare policy decisions uh, that need to be made by the middle of 2017 to guide the fare, fare collection system final design configuration so that can be featured for those features can be established by next spring uh, in order to maintain the schedule for that important element of the project. Various decisions um, concerning the future operations of the integrated bus and rail transit system, as is indicated here. Uh, these decisions, I think, has already been noted by the chair, uh, may be informed greatly by uh, whatever that comes out of the Charter Commission and what happens uh, if uh, something is presented to the voters in November. Uh, there will need to be some progress on determining how the operating and maintenance costs of the future bus rail system will be paid for. And finally, um, the board will need to make a decision on when it wants to proceed uh, with uh, planning for uh, future rail extensions of the project. Next slide, please. Uh, and my final slide um, is to talk a little bit about project challenges and risks, and these are things that uh, bedeviled the project for the past several years. Uh, the continued high level of construction uh, on the island is impacting labor, material, and equipment availability, and hence uh, in impacting costs greatly. Uh, you need to be cognizant of schedule delays or that might impact uh, things and add, add costs, including the timely available construction sites for contractors, timely approval of needed permits and utility relocations, and any delays uh, uh, on that. You know, unfortunate delays in awarding of contracts could uh, be a potential risk to the project. Uh, shortly in the beginning of the new year, you'll need to issue some short-term debt to match your cash flow needs while you're waiting for GEP and for FDA uh, funding reimbursements to occur. And then finally, there's the question of actual versus projected DE GET receipts uh, coming in in the future. Um, Chair Hanabusa, members of the board, thank you again for the opportunity. Uh, next slide, the final slide. Uh, I want to thank you again for the opportunity to work with you. I'd be glad to uh, hang on the line, answer any questions, or support any discussion that you uh, would like to have uh, following up on uh, what I presented to you here today. Members, any questions? Do we need to vote on this? No, right? No. Members, any questions? Mr. Thank Mr. you, Chair. Uh, Ron, uh, hi, Terry Lee here. Um, you know, as you may have, may or may not have heard, you know, the um, the FTA has withheld 250 million from last year, and now they're indicating they're going to withhold the other 250 million for this year. And so, have you any thoughts about, you know, what that impact will be on our cash flow, and the timing of when we might have to seek the bond? I financial? think uh, your financial staff is in a better position yeah. to answer that I, question. I was aware of those uh, those delays, and I think that uh, as the staff 
uh, his works with the FDA over the course of the next several months um, that um, and gets the an updated financial plan together that those funds will be released to the project but uh, the need for the short-term debt will be in part informed by uh, what the what the cash needs are for the project and uh, in anticipation of eventually getting uh, that almost 500 million dollars uh, from the federal government Hi, Ron. It's uh, Dan. I can answer that question. So we have um, sufficient funds on hand from prior authorizations or appropriations from the Congress to certainly get us through this year, maybe even the early part of next year, before we'd be in a position of um, wanting to draw down federal funds but not having them available. Um, and that certainly fits within the time frame that the FTA has given us to try to come up with a revised uh, financial plan. So. Um, the, the, the UN the board members and the public should know that uh, we have been able to draw down uh, federal money on a regular monthly basis um, and we have not had any interruption to affecting our cash flow. So um, I would, if we're at the end of the year or the early part of next year, we would be in a position where we would start to see that we'd be running out of money on the federal side for reimbursement. And so, Dan, when were we when were we scheduled to seek the bond financing? So, um, we will likely do short-term commercial paper uh, drawdowns in concert with the Budget and Fiscal Services uh, sometime uh, this June, July is what I, I guess the current estimates are. And then, depending on how quickly we um, utilize the commercial paper, then we would be in a position to um, take that debt out from short term and put it into by I would say long term because it's about 10 year debt through 2027 um, and that would be in consultation with BFS and that'll probably be like maybe next May or June is what current estimates are. The <coughs> only thing that could change that, a couple of things that could change that would be if we have um, if uh, we see interest rates climbing up, we might want to take some of that money out sooner um, because the interest rates are historic lows. Uh, so we might want to do something in the spring rather than in the summer. Um, and then the other thing would just be monitoring our cash flow and see how quickly we are actually drawing uh, against the commercial paper. Mm. So the short version there is commercial paper in, um, in a couple months and probably not till the spring summer of next year would we then do the longer term debt. So, so Worst case scenario, if if how long can we delay receiving the federal funds that are being withheld currently yep. before it impacts our our uh, negatively impacts our cash flow projection? Um, <coughs> worst case is we draw it down fast enough that it would be the end of this year, like December. Um, more likely, though, based on our current burn rate, and we discussed yesterday with the folks, it's probably. Uh, we probably have enough to get us even into f a couple few months of the next calendar year of 2017 yes a and so to free up the withheld funds we have to do what with the fta so the fta fta's last communication with us specifically on this was from acting administrator therese mcmillan to the mayor in november of last year and it basically said that a few things needed to happen. Uh, one was that there needed to be uh, the passage of the general excise tax and a commitment, therefore, that there was money going to be available. Secondly, that there was a number of pieces of information that they needed from Hart, um, not notably uh, our cash flows, um, our current estimates for construction, schedule, and so on. And that would be all a part of this risk refresh. So we've supplied all that already to them. And we've already had the risk refresh re report. The last thing that the letter says is that um, that the money would certainly be freed up at the acceptance of a new final f uh, f um, financial plan. Um, we've made the uh, we've made the um, the suggestion to the FTA that be, in, you know as a show of good faith, it would be nice if they were able to free up one of those two tranches of money that you mentioned that they're holding because we actually have fulfilled all of their obligations. And a little bit, it's in their court. Um, because they've got to come up with um, their risk refresh response and then they've got to work with us on the financial plan. So um, while it doesn't have any adverse impact on us, obviously we suggested that we fulfilled everything up to this date, including the biggest thing, which was getting the extension of the general excise tax. So, um, but if you go by the letter of, that le of the last letter, um, it would be once the financial plan is accepted. And, and so as part of getting that financial plan accepted, I mean, does the FTA have to agree with our our cost and revenue projections? They do. And and so far, have we 
gotten any feedback from them on their views about that? So um, we are, I think I described it's an iterative process. We've given over to them a lot of information and data. They've done their own analysis. Um, they've recently come back with uh, some updated information that they've given to us that we're, um, I think they're going to give us three or four weeks to actually review and comment back. And then based on that, um, our expectation is that then they would produce a final report that would be public, and that would be what they believe is the um, schedule and the budget that they would recommend going forward. And that, again, as I mentioned before, the last time they did this, it took about four months. I think they're trying to do it a little bit quicker. I had estimated that by, by August, but it could be even sooner in July by the time they have a final report. But they have uh, given over to us uh, intermediate information recently that we're reviewing. So as we sit here today, Dan, are you fairly confident that we will complete this process before the end of the year so that the FTA will free up these funds for us? That's the schedule that they'd like to see too, yes. But I mean, but are you comfortable that, that it, we it, can achieve that? It's going to really depend. It's a, I can't speak for the FTA. So they could take longer, um, but the goal is certainly to try to do that. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Anyone else have any questions? Yes, Mr. <clears throat> Louis Kwan. Uh, Ron, Ron Tober, Ivan Louis Kwan here. Is, are you there, Ron? Yes, I am. Um, j just for the view and audience, uh, what happened is um, before Mr. Tober made his, um, his, his recommendations and his comments, he met with, by telephone, all the board members. And so what I wanted to do, Ron, is to, to, to refer back to the discussion that you and I had on the telephone. Um, and one of the things you said was that, um, and this was not a substantive matter, but just um, an ancillary comment that you made that, that caught, that piqued my, my interest. And, and that is, um, as we all know, the airport section, um, the independent cost estimates are right now at approximately $820 million. The Civic Center independent cost estimates are approximately $866 million. And the thing that piqued my interest, and I'd like you to comment on this again, is um, based on your um, information, and I'm not sure what information you have, you thought that would be fairly close to those independent cost estimates. Can you comment on that? Well, I mean, given the experience that you had uh, with the guideway contracts on the western portion of the alignment, and yes, they are, particularly the center city, much more complex environment, uh, particularly from a traffic mitigation standpoint and a business impact standpoint, as uh, Brennan talked about much earlier in your board meeting. Um, that I still, I th my sense is that um, uh, unless something very unusual happens, those numbers should be fairly good for you. And that's just based upon my experience in the business. Uh, we'll see what happens. You do have some contingency left in the project, uh, uh, the $6.8 billion project number. Uh, so I'm optimistic that uh, those are going to be okay, but who knows? I mean, uh, uh, it's uh, anybody's guess right now with uh, the high level of construction environment that you're trying to get uh, proposals from these contractors on. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Did I answer your question, Ivan? Um, yes, you answered the question. I was hoping that you would be able to identify sources that say yes, um, those ICEs, um, um, you were on, on solid ground, but obviously, you know, um, um, it's just based on your, your, your experience. So thank you, Ron. Yes, it's based upon my experience. I think in, in uh, uh, you know, we talked about a number of things during the conversation, uh, you know, including some of the, extent, the discussion about extensions, but uh, uh, I don't think anybody can give you, a, you know, an absolute concrete number. I think you've got a good co independent cost estimate number to work with right now and to see what happens com coming out of these procurements. Okay, thank you, Ron. Any other questions, <coughs> members? Dan, I, I just want to clarify that. Are those numbers ICE numbers, 820 and 8, 866? The 820 is an independent cost estimate I number. thought 866 was it. 866 is not our new independent. It's a, it is a previous cost estimate, but the updated independent cost estimate that, will be, that is being prepared will actually be issued in June. Because I think the uh, 8, just so that we're clear, I think the 866 did not include the uh, undergrounding of uh, Dillingham. 
And the sequencing issue. Yeah, I'd have to go back. Uh, but I do know that that is all being taken into account with the new independent cost estimate for a city center. Because I, I just thought it was very unusual to have estimates for airport and city center to be only 40 million apart. Just almost yeah. seems impossible. Yeah. Yeah given the nature of the construction that we know is involved. And I appreciate the question because, um, again, we do periodic estimates and we go by the last, most recent one, but the one for air, the city center is, um, will be done in June. Yep, so I just wanted you not to be misled by that. So the ICE estimate for city center is not in. Okay. The independent estimate. Thank it, you. It just sounds very strange to have it only 46 million delta. And the, but the 866 million is the the city center. I, I know that's yeah. the city center, but that's the the most recent that we have, and you see that's going to be updated as of June. Yes. Okay. Because I think what's the difference is I do not believe that the uh, the undergrounding was made a part of that. Oh, I see. Thank you. So thank you. Any other questions? Yes. I'm sorry, Chair. Yeah, uh, Dan. You know, going back to the the subject that I was uh, querying you on. If we can't get the FDA sign off by the end of the year, and you know that's not that much, that's not that far away. Should we be looking at what our options are yep. in terms of how we're going to continue funding the project going forward? So the way that um, so the way that it works is that uh, we, the heart and the city, actually have to spend a dollar, and then we're reimbursed 30 cents on that dollar, basically. And so if we got to the situation where our monthly drawdowns aren't available to us, then it would impact cash flow, as you mentioned earlier. And it would just mean that if we were now in that period of time where we're borrowing, it would increase our cost to the project um, because we'd end up having to borrow what we otherwise would get as a monthly reimbursement. So every month that went by, if we were drawing down you know, X number of millions of dollars, we'd have to borrow that money to maintain the cash flow available to pay our bills as opposed to getting our monthly drawdowns. But does that mean we'd have to then seek additional bond financing over and beyond what we've what we've been approved for? We, uh, well, we would, yes, we would be borrowing more money on a temporary basis in order to make up the cash flow need we have, yes. And that requires council approval, doesn't it? Every borrowing um, requires council approval. We've gotten the approval from council already for the commercial paper right. drawdowns, but um, every time that there is a borrowing, and actually BFS does it on our behalf, um, Hart doesn't actually mechanically go to Wall Street to borrow, uh, BFS does, they, they have to go to city council. We have to go to city council to get approval. <coughs> but based on the comments that you've gotten from the FTA so far, that we're now preparing the response to, do you see issues? Oh, I think that um, there's certainly going to be um, pretty um, significant issues around schedule and cost um, that we're going to have to work out. They're going to be looking at things perhaps differently, and we're going to have to make sure that we align ourselves to whatever the schedule and cost that, that they think that we're facing. Sorry. Any other questions? Yes. So is that something that we should be monitoring, the fund availability of funds and how close we are to not having that? Is that something that we need information and presentation on at our meetings? Yeah. If, uh, if the sense of the committee is that we should, uh, we're missing somebody. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, if, if the sense of the committee is that we should uh, continue uh, to have that information, and I think it would be critical for us to to know, especially, and then we know what the significance of not having those tranches. So, I mean, the the question was whether we should have our financial, uh, I guess, status at every meeting, because the discussion while you stepped out was was about uh, it started with Terry's inquiry on on the tranches and, and uh, follow up on where are we. It, I, I, if I may, Chair, I uh, call your attention uh, to uh, page 19 of our monthly report. Um, there we do give you a, a, a breakdown of uh, our drawdowns. So uh, if you were to uh, look at the bottom uh, figure nine on page 19, you'll see that uh, we're still drawing against federal fiscal $13. Um, so we have, we have about $31 million left in that. Mm -hmm. And then we have drawn down, we have, 
Uh, then you can see in the next column down it says 2014, $250 million. So we have not drawn down any of that $250 million. And then to board uh, member Lee's uh, comments, then you'll see uh, 20 uh, FFY 15, 250 million is pending award. That's the first tranche that they're holding. Likewise, the 2016 um, that they're holding. And then 2017 is actually pending in the Congress right now. So um, basically, we have available to us 250 million of F FY 14 money plus 31 million and change of FFY 13. So you can watch this on a monthly basis and see how we're drawing down. Um, each month, and the warning, of course, that again, uh, Board Member Lee is, is concerned about is when we're burning through the next 250 million, um, that if that we go through that and, and we don't have the next 500 million made available to us, then we're in that situation. So you can follow this on a monthly basis. Okay, and page 20 actually shows our cash balance. Yes. Okay. Uh, that's well, why. Does that answer yeah. your question? Okay. But uh, ma ma Madam Chair, um, I, I think that's really a good idea, and I wanted to, to um, kind of mention that also, you know, with respect to um, the reordering of the, the meetings. Mm -hmm. And I, I really think it's important to have a um, finance committee meeting on a regular basis, you know, because of those questions and because of what's happening with the FDA, because of what's happening with the, the, um, the contracts. Um, clearly, everybody's focused on that. And, and, you know, as we've gone to meetings with the council and one-on-one -on -one briefings and in the, meeting, in the, con in the budget committee, so um, I'd, I'd um, <clears throat> um, ask for your indulgence to, you know, to uh, schedule us on a regular basis. I actually have, um, and sorry I didn't get the memo out quick enough, was that uh, I believe that the chairs of the respective committees should feel free to proceed and schedule your meetings as you deem necessary and whatever topics that you feel the only thing I ask is that you just let me know but yeah. work with Cindy on on the, the agenda and your time yeah and as uh, for those uh, who may be watching us and may not uh, have heard this earlier is the fact that like chair form formby for his oversight committee has chosen to meet at least the next meeting in the evening to facilitate the public and so any any member who is uh, a chair of a committee, of a member of this board, who <coughs> feels that somehow your information will get out better on a certain day or a certain time, uh, as long as Cindy can work it out, uh, I think that that should be within your discretion and also what topics. Because I'm assuming that if you're interested enough to set, step forward as the chair, you have an idea of what you would like to, to do. And the only problem or the only caveat I have is to the extent that it's going to require staff, then you're going to have to coordinate with Dan uh, for the staff availability and whether they can produce things. But I think that the, the, our committee, our board, has taken an affirmative position that we want to ensure transparency and we also want to ensure that the public gets the kind of information that you feel they should have. Yeah, and I, I, I appreciate that. Um, one of the, the things that's crossing my mind is that um, as chair, we'd want to coordinate with you to make sure that we're optimizing if efficiency of utilization of, you know, uh, members' time. So we can, you know, because it, it, there's big demands, so we don't want to have too many days of meetings is what I'm thinking. Um, want to so that people can come and take a tranche of their day and then have you know, the meetings together somehow. But we'll work it out with you and with, with our administrator. I, I think that that may have worked before, but I think as you can tell from our, our, our board meetings, our board meetings have gone longer because we have great discussion. But I think that uh, we may, I'm probably more inclined to say board meetings should be on one day and everybody knows it's on one day, and then the committee meetings may be falling into different days. And my understanding is that's how it used to be. I think when you were chair. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I can't remember that far back. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, so that there may be, in, in yeah. essence, um, you know, uh, uh, maybe committee member committees that do not have issues, or do not have long issues, may go on a certain day, and committees that have longer issues may have on, on another day. But I think that that's a, 
very efficient way for us to utilize everyone's time. And, you know, I think that uh, this is an important subject, and we're getting really to the, the crunch time on a lot of these decisions. And I think that as a result of that, um, it may not be unreasonable to, to request that uh, board members give uh, two days a month or so of, of their time. And, and I know that uh, there's a lot of prep work that goes into everyone, and we all appreciate that, but that's just the way it goes, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it is an important project. It's the biggest CIP project in the history of the state, and yeah. that's why I think everyone is so intent. Of, and, we, and we know we have money issues, we have timing issues, we have you know, utility issues, we have all kinds of issues that we have to, we have to clearly work through. Yeah, so. and I, I, I appreciate that. Um, that, but it, you know, just for the for the, the view in public, um, we have meetings um, once a month right now, and now potentially twice a month mm -hmm. you know, with committees on one day and and board members on the other. But um, I think I want people to understand that I know you work incredibly hard, um, going to meetings and going to uh, project oversight meetings, going to council meetings, and we all do the same. For example, last week. You know, I don't know how many times I um, we met with just about every council member mm -hmm. on a one-on-one -on -one basis to brief them about the budget, and then there were a number of um, budget committee meetings and and, and council meetings, um, and then you have you're going to have your permitted interaction group meetings, and so there's a huge investment of time made by every board member here. And so it's not, and what they see um, is just the, the, the tip of the iceberg, which is really these meetings. Right. And these meetings must seem very long to them as well, but they don't know <laughs> what has gone into getting to this point. Right. But, uh, so uh, what, uh, any other questions, members? If not, uh, thank you. Mr. Tober, we don't need any uh, board action on this. This is your report to heart, and thank you very much for your time and for the report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Members, um, we are going to lose another member very shortly, and with that we lose both our quorum and, as well as our voting quorum. So I am going to skip to item number uh, 19 which is the executive director and CEO's performance evaluation and upcoming performance objectives. So that's um, Mr. Okay. Kim. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, Madam Chair, that if I can call for executive session. Um, so I'd like to entertain, entertain a motion to enter into executive session pursuant to Hawaii Revised Status Section 92-4 and subsections 92-5A4 and 92-5A2 to consider the annual evaluation of executive director CEO where considerations of matters affecting privacy will be involved and to consult with the committee's board's attorney on questions and issues pertaining to the committee's board, powers, duties, privileges, immunities, liabilities with regards to these matters. Can we have a motion to that effect? So moved by Mr. Hong, second? Second. Second by Mr. Lee. So members, we are going to go into executive session. Um, members of the public, we will be leaving these premises and we will return uh, at when we are done. Uh, we are not adjourning, we are just moving into executive session. Thank you very much, members. We are back from executive session, and the uh, committee, the board, is still uh, continuing in their investigation. With that, members, I am losing quorum, both voting plus numbers. And so we will have to defer the remaining items of this agenda and uh, we will reconvene at our next meeting. Thank you, so we are adjourned. Thank you.